This program is brought to you by Cable Franchise Vs and generous donations from viewers like you. Based on Governor Baker's executive order suspending certain provisions of the open meeting law, uh, GL Chapter 30A, Section 20, and signed Thursday, March 12th, 2020, this planning board meeting is being held virtually using the Zoom platform. My name is Jack Jemsek, and as the chair of the Amherst Planning Board, I am calling this meeting to order at 6.30 p.m. This meeting is being recorded and is available via Amherst Media live stream. Minutes are being taken as normal. Board members, I will take a roll call when I call your name, unmute yourself, answer affirmatively, and then please place yourself back on mute. Uh, Maria Chow? Here. Tom Long? Here. Andrew McDougall, McDougal, sorry. <laughs> Here. Doug Marshall? Present. Janet McGowan? Here. Johanna Newman? Present. And myself, present. So board members, if technical difficulties arise, we may need to pause temporarily to correct the problem and then continue the meeting. If you do have technical issues, please let Pam know. Um, discussion may be suspended uh, while a techni technical issue uh, is addressed and the minutes uh, will note if this occurred. Please use the raise hand function to ask a question or make a comment. And so, and okay, opportunity for public comment will be provided during the general public comment item and other appropriate times during the meeting. Please be aware the board will not respond to comments during the general public uh, comment period. If you wish to make a comment during the public comment period, you must join the meeting via the Zoom teleconferencing link. This link is shown on the slide uh, before us. And, uh, and the link, uh, it's also on the list on the meeting agenda that you can grab from the, from the website. Um, and please indicate if you wish to make a comment by clicking the raised hand button when the public comment is solicited. If you have joined Zoom meeting using a telephone, please indicate you wish to make a comment by pressing star nine on your telephone. When called on, please identify yourself by stating your full name and address and put yourself back into mute when finished. Uh, residents can express their views for up to three minutes and at the discretion of the chair, if a speaker does not comply with these guidelines or exceeds their allotted time, their participation will be disconnected from the meeting. So uh, we have the agenda in front of us. And uh, again, this is a, we, uh, we have some special, um, um, special, um, I don't want to call events today, uh, both good and bad. Um, so lots on our mind, collective mind. Uh, and it's just, I think, reason I think all of us would like to not, you know, go too long into the evening uh, here. Uh, just looking at the, uh, the, the schedule, I think, you know, Amherst Hills subdivision uh, shouldn't take too long. Uh, you know, the chapter 40 are and, and, and zoning priorities are probably our, our main focus. So maybe, you know, we can do, you know, 30 minutes, each of those. And then I think, uh, then we have the, uh, the zoning lighting review and then in new business, we have the comprehensive, comprehensive housing policy. So a lot of these items, uh, I think we need to do additional work on, but I think, no, we, we definitely want to focus on the 40R and zoning priorities. Um, with that said, uh, we can uh, look to review the minutes from November 18th. And does anyone want to make a motion regarding the minutes? I move to accept the minutes. Okay, Janet. Uh, second. I'll second. Andrew. That, I'll second. That was Andrew's second. Okay. Any discussion? I see none. Okay. Yeah, I think you did a great job, Pam. Uh, thank you. 
Uh, so uh, we'll do a roll call here. Oops. Uh, Maria. Approve. Tom. Approve. Andrew. Approve. Doug. Aye. Janet. Approve. Johanna. Approve. And myself approve. So seven zero. So top of the old business is to um, have Chris Brestrip introduce us to Amherst Hills subdivision. Uh, I feel some of the members here probably need a, a little bit of background on this. And I don't think a decision is going to be made tonight on this, but uh, Chris, can you introduce this? And do we have anyone in the, in the, in the audience that needs to be pulled in on this, I wonder? Um, Jack, yeah, can we Jim. Do public comment. Are we going to? Oh, did I skip over that? Yeah. Um. Public comment on things that are not on the agenda. Right. Yeah. General I don't, public comment. So, uh, Jim, Jim uh, Master Alexis has his hand up, but I, I, I know that I thought that was with regard to Amherst Hills. So. Um, I mean, we can ask him. You okay. Looks like there's no public comment on things that are not on the agenda. And Mr. Master Alexis has a comment probably on the first thing that is on the agenda. Is that yeah, correct? so we can bring him in. Oh, you, al you also have Pam Rooney's hand up now. So now I'm not sure. Are we doing general comment or Amherst? Right. Well, let me clear with Jim. Uh, okay. What his, so if, he, you, he has been enabled to speak. Oh. Jim, can you hear us? I can hear you. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. All right. Mr. Chairman, I'll, I'll, I'll either speak briefly now or I don't know if you allow, would allow me to speak after, you ta after Ms. Brestrup. Talks well, I think you're, you're going to speak with regard to Amherst Hills. Correct. Which is on the agenda. So we'll just, you, you just stay put, don't go anywhere. Uh, and let's, um, let's Pam Rooney. As, as Pam Rooney. Yes. yes. That's fine. Thank you. Okay. Hi, Pam Rooney, uh, 42 Cottage Street. Again, just trying to figure out if we are talking public comment on this agenda or if we should wait for item B or item C or item D to speak. It's on other items that are not on the agenda. Um, okay, then I'll not speak now. Thank you. Okay, we'll, we'll, we'll be soliciting comments on the individual items. Thank you. Um, so old business, Amherst Hills uh, subdivision, uh, considering a request from the developer for release from a notice uh, by the building commissioner requesting that he refrain from issuing building permits for certain lots. So, uh, Chris, if you want to give a little bit of a background on this for the for the new board members, that would be great. Yeah, that, okay, that's good. I gave a, a little bit of a summary on this in sub September, but you may um, have forgotten some of those things because you, a lot of you were new at that time. So uh, I just thought I'd run down um, kind of a summary of the Amherst Hills subdivision and where we are with it right now. Um, so the subdivision has been under development since the early 90s. It, um, I think, initially was permitted sometime in the 80s. Um, and it's been very slow to develop. Um, there was an economic downturn in 2008 that lasted a number of years, so that kind of slowed it down. Um, another thing happened was that its uh, developer, Doug Cole, who was um, the own, uh, one of the owners of Tofino and also Cole Construction, passed away shortly after 2008. I think it might have been 2009 or 2010. And then after that, um, Doug's successors had uh, kind of a difficult time pulling things together. So, so things had a very slow start. Um, the roadway was begun in the early 2000s. Uh, and the roadway was constructed um, in, in pieces, uh, but the top coat was not installed on any of those parts and it deteriorated over the years. Um, the developer who is now Tofino Associates and has been Tofino Associates, um, would like the town to take the roadway, and I, that means that the town would ad adopt the roadway as a public way, 
and then um, the town would be responsible for maintaining the roadway and um, plowing it and everything. Um, and this was the intention at the time that the subdivision was permitted. I believe that the uh, residents are very eager to have the town take the roadway as well. Um, <clears throat> so uh, over the years, the town has had a policy of recommending not installing the top coat on a road until most of the houses are built. And this is because the town doesn't want heavy equipment that's used to build the houses to travel over the top course, course of a subdivision road. Um, and this works well for small developments that are um, fairly quickly um, developed, such as the Vista Terrace one in South Amherst that you're familiar with, um, which you have uh, had a review last spring of that. Um, and then recently uh, released uh, the last lot on that subdivision. But um, this particular subdivision, Amherst Hills, has taken a long time to complete. And um, so the base course deteriorated over time and um, the, the residents of Amherst Hills came to the planning board last fall, fall of 2019 and said, you know, this is really a problem. We understand from the DPW that they're um, reluctant to plow the road in the winter of 2019, 2020. So the, the planning board really kind of dug in and, and decided to try to do something about it. And we consulted our uh, town attorney. And at the time, um, all I believe all of the lots except those on the cul-de-sac of uh, Linden Hill, L Linden Ridge Road had been released. But um, at the time, the, the residents were asking the planning board to rescind the release of some of the lots. Um, but with the advice of the town attorney, the planning board um, took a different route and issued a letter to the building commissioner, uh, which was filed at the Registry of Deeds, requesting that the building commissioner not issue building permits for certain lots that had not been built upon until action was taken to fix or complete the roadway. Um, uh, there were complications that the developer had with the Conservation Commission, which caused delays and other things. There's also a lawsuit between the developer and the residents to which we are not really privy. But those things turn out not to have too much relevance right now in what you're being asked to do. Um, since we last talked, the developer has finished the work on the roadways themselves, the pavement in themselves. And they've spent, spent over $400,000 on that work. I think I saw an estimate of $440,000 that they've spent. And the town engineer says that the roadways have been completed to his satisfaction. Um, however, there's still work off the roadways. And I think a lot of it has to do with either sidewalks or drainage that still needs to be completed. And this work is related to the subdivision road. So the town engineer has given us a list of those items and um, has given us an estimate of about $230,000 to complete that work. Um, the town has a three-party agreement uh, among the town of Amherst, Greenfield Savings Bank, and the developer to hold about $289,000 as security to guarantee that the work will be completed. So this $289,000 um, that Greenfield Savings Bank is uh, is holding um, is more than the amount uh, that the, the uh, developer that the town says would be needed to complete the off-road work that's associated with the subdivision road. Um, so the attorney for the developer has requested that the planning board release the lots that are currently being held under this notice that was filed at the registry. Um, allowing the developer to develop or sell those lots. Um, we just received this request, I think it was December 23rd, so that was right before the holidays. So it was, uh, even though it's been two weeks since then, it just seems like a flash in the pan. Um, so we just received that, that request. Um, meanwhile, the attorney for the residents, uh, Mark Tanner, I think I forwarded his communications to you. So he's with um, Bacon Wilson, which is the same firm as our, um, our acquaintance, Tom Reedy, just to point that out to you. Uh, anyway, he, uh, Mr. Tanner, um, is representing the residents and he's requested that changes be made to the three-party agreement, um, but the residents aren't party to the three-party agreement. He's just making uh, suggestions and recommendations as to how to 
tighten up this agreement so that it would be um, ex or uh, that that it would satisfy the needs of the residents. And I haven't had time to review these requested changes um, with our town attorney, Joel Bard from KP Law. Um, and I haven't really had time to talk to him about the release of the lots and how that release relates to the money that's being held by Greenfield Savings Bank. So I think uh, it appears that the planning board would be able to release the lots based on having the sum of about $289,000 in security. Um, but I really need to talk to Joel Bard about this and um, figure out, are there changes that need to be made to the three-party agreement? And, and how do we document this transaction? So. Um, so I think we're moving towards releasing the lots, but we want to make sure that we do it correctly um, with our town attorney's advice. And um, so that's what I have to say for right now. And I'm going to get in touch with Joel about this um, in the next few days. And I hope to have a little bit better, more clear recommendation from, for you um, by the time we meet again, which would be January 20th. But at this time, I would not recommend that you release the lots, that you vote to release the lots tonight. Okay. Thank you, Chris. Uh, I'd like to recognize Janet. I, I would agree with you, Christine, because I when I read the three-party agreement, the performance agreement, I had questions about um, what are the obligations? Like, what did it cover? And it seemed like Parts of it said it was just narrowly covering the roads, and then parts of it said the obligations seemed to be broader, like you know, part of the subdivision permit and something called the attached schedule of values, which I didn't have. And so I feel a little nervous about relying on the performance agreement without understanding what it really covers. And it, the language did seem sort of loosey-goosey and kind of going back and forth. So I could send my thoughts on that to you or Joel, but I did feel very nervous about just relying on that when I wasn't quite sure what the agreement was covering. Um, and so then- Can I suggest something? How sure. about if Janet and I have a conversation on the telephone about this? Because I think, um, you know, there, there, is, there are some reasonable questions about the performance agreement. We have a performance agreement in place, which you've received in your packet, but mm -hmm. then you received another um, recommended changes to the performance agreement that are suggested by the resident's attorney. So yeah. I'm not clear about what the role of the residence attorney is in this in this whole thing. And I don't know if Joel Bard is going to um, recommend that we take the residence attorney's suggestions and incorporate them into the agreement. I know that the um, attorney for the developer is not willing to take all of those changes. And uh, however, he is willing to extend the date of completion. So he's told me, this is Michael Pill, who represents the developer. He's told me that he's willing to uh, extend the date of the agreement, but he's not willing to um, make any of the other changes. So I think it would be worthwhile for Janet, Janet's an attorney, and me to have a conversation about this. And then I'll talk to Joel, and then I can get back to the board about this whole thing. So I, I think that's a great idea. I, have, I also have a question because um, this sounds a little complicated to adjust the agreement and every, and also we're in between bickering parties and things like that, which is never that much fun, but doable. Um, if there's just, you know, the sidewalks and a few storm drains and they put them in, then everything's over, right? And so is, is there a chance that, you know, the developer, you know, come spring is able to put those in and then we all just kind of release everybody and say goodbye and you know, wish everybody well. And I, I am quite frustrated. I, I think I left a message for you of like, we have actually never seen anyone from Tofino. No one's ever come talk to us or Mr. Pill has never come in. And that's a question we could just ask him to, right now. It's like, how close are you to getting this done? You know, you know, if you're really close and you're going to do it in April, then let's just do that and, you know, just finish the work. And, we're, you know, it's it's been a strange process of never having the developer or his attorney here and we we you know we kind of talk about this a lot and make a little step and never really get a back and forth so i, I would love to see mr pill or um someone from tofino come in but I, we could continue this kind of odd process um but if they're close to being done 
and it's you know probably going to be less than two hundred thousand. Maybe that's the faster way for us to go than having everybody negotiate. So those are just thoughts. Doug. <laughs> Um, oh, sorry, did you have something to add, Chris? You no, know, I, I tend to agree with Janet. Um, I'm not sure how uh, important it is to act quickly on this, on the part of the developer, how, um, how much on the brink he is of not being able to do anything if we don't release the lot. So I need to talk to him, although you probably would like to hear from him as well. So there's more information that needs to be gathered about this whole thing. And I'm uncomfortable taking the, um, the recommendations of the resident's attorney to change uh, an agreement to which the residents are not a party. Mm -hmm. um, so I tend to think that Janet may be correct and leave the agreement the way it is and see what work can be done in the next six months, but that's not a that's not a, a thought that's been really well thought out. So that's, that's all I have to say right now. Um, I, quick question, Chris, did, did the town, does the town get compensated somehow within this, you know, when, at, at some point with regard to the agreement and, and, and us having, you know, to have town council review yeah. it and, and that sort of thing? No. No? Okay. All right, Doug? Yeah, I had one one question for Chris, which was um, when Jason Skeels is emailed to you transmitting his estimate of the scope of work and the $230,000 cost, uh, he noted that it was difficult to see exactly what needed to be done because the snow was covering the ground. Mm -hmm. um, I would like to basically request that you talk to him and see whether it would be worth him going back out now that this, the ground is pretty much clear and uh, double checking his scope. Mm -hmm. I will do that. Thank you. Andrew. Oh, sorry. Thanks, Jack. Yeah, I, I was just suspecting that maybe you know the urgency here is just this is a great time to sell uh, a house in Amherst so I, I don't know I mean I, I agree with everything that Janet said and hopefully at some point in the future we can get Tofino to to come in and make that case because this does seem a little ridiculous at this point. Chris were you going to say something? I wanted to answer a question that Doug asked me via email and his question to me was, it looks like the attorney for the residents is not suggesting that any lots be released. And I wanted to clarify that. Um, the agreement lists certain lots on uh, one of the beginning pages um, that are actually on the cul-de-sac of Linden Ridge Road. And let me see where that is. So on page um, two of the agreement, about a third of the way down the page, it says covenant contract as guarantee for obligations. So, so those lots, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, and 18, those are on a roadway, a piece of roadway that is not, has not been built, may never get built, um, and therefore those would be held as part of the covenant contract. Um, the lots that are asked that they're asking to be released are, um, well, I can't remember where exactly that's noted, but essentially they're asking that all the lots be released except for those um, lots that are held in the covenant contract under paragraph four. So that's my answer to Doug's question. Any other comments from the board? See none. So um, again, the the project proponent uh, doesn't have a representative here, uh, but I believe Jim Master Alexis can speak at this time. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Oh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, thank you for letting me speak here today. And um, 
I know today's a sad and troubling day in American history and the troubles of our neighborhood subdivision here are, you know, pale in comparison to what's going on. So I'm going to be very brief, I promise you here. Um, I want, just want to kind of hit a few points here from what I've heard tonight. Um, the subdivision is an older subdivision. I've lived here for 15 years, okay? We moved in in 2015 and we really need, and the town really needs to um, influence the developer to finish the work. Now, the reason why our lawyer put together that proposal is, and for those of you that don't know me, I, I'm a lawyer. I've been a lawyer for 30 years. But I'm, that doesn't mean anything here. But in reading that three-party agreement, the, um, that's the document that's currently known, uh, commonly known as a three-party agreement, there's a real question, and Ms. McGowan hit the nail on the head, there's a real question as to whether the three-party agreement would cover the remaining $230,000 worth of work. And by the way, just so the members of the board, just so we're clear, that $230,000 worth of work is required in the definitive plan, which was passed by a previous planning board when the subdivision was approved. So all that work that remains is are things that the um, developer is required to do. So the, if you have a, and I, I think it's necessary for anyone on the board here to talk to your town council, your town attorney, um, Mr. Baird, to talk about our edits on the agreement, because what our edits on the agreement, again, we're not party to the agreement. All our edits do is to ensure that the work is done the $230,000 of work is done because it would be the only security on the project. Because to be clear, the planning board already released the lots. We came before the board and said, take back the lots, rescind that because the, the roads need to be reconstructed. And attorney Baird, and the, this is a letter that was in your packet. Attorney Baird said that the planning board could in fact rescind the release of the lots, or they had a choice, which is fine, to do what you did, put a moratorium on building permits and sewer hookups. And that really is the only meaningful security that exists, existed, and in my view, that's why the roads were reconstructed, and that's why Tofino did the work. And by the way, Thank you for making the point that we are the only people that have showed up at these meetings. We live here. This is a very important um, issue for us. So Tofino did the work and the roads are fixed and they're very well done. According to the town engineer, they look great. We appreciate that. But if the moratoriums are lifted before the um, agreement is amended, there's a real question on whether that um, agreement covers the remaining work. I think it's a, it would be fine for me if you kept the moratoriums on and said to the developer, finish the work by April 1st. And I'm just picking that date out of the air. In our edits, we gave them the date of September 1st just to be reasonable. We didn't want to push uh, and be unreasonable. But if they can do the work earlier, and the moratoriums can stay on and they can finish the work, then you can take them off and everything will be fine. And I just want to make one more point. The residents in the neighborhood, we didn't sue anybody. They sued us because, and Christine Brestrup is correct when she says only the base layer of the road was done. They sued us saying that we had the obligation to reconstruct the road, bring in the big milling machines, which they did go down to the earth and repave the road. That's ridiculous. We are not developers and we in no way agreed to do that. So they're suing us. And what we want, the planning board's obligations here with all due respect is to ensure that the developer does the work. A number of us, a number of us have lived here 15, 14, 13 years. How long does it have to take for a subdivision to be completed or the work that's required to be completed? And I know there have been some awful things that happened and Doug Cole was a great guy, okay? Um, 
but this project has to be completed. And I would urge the planning board not to do anything that removes the security that's necessary on this project that ensures the developer do the work. Um, and, you know, the, the planning board sits and represents the town, but the town is the people here and we're the people here. And we really need you to help us um, because we're not a party to the three party agreement. And all we're looking for is adequate security. So the work is done. If the work is done quicker, that's fine. Um, and I want to remind the member, this is the last thing I'll say. I want to remind the members of the board. I know that they did a lot of work recently and you know, there's been some talk oh, but we want them to recoup their investment. There are, there are 67 lots in this neighborhood. Tofino bought the entire, pro, entire 67 lots out of bankruptcy for $425,000, okay? And if you've ever been up to my neighborhood, a lot in this neighborhood goes for about 175 dollars to $200,000. It's a beautiful neighborhood. They've made their money back hand over fist. It's time now to do the work. Please make sure there's adequate security on this project. And thank you very much, um, as you always have, for listening to me when I've come before you. Thank you. Thank you, Jim. Um, any other comments from the public? I don't see any hands raised. Um, Chris, do you have any final comments? Um, just that I'm I'm going to have a conversation with Janet on the phone about this, and then I'm going to call Joel Bard, and I also want to talk to the building commissioner. Um, and so I'll, next time we meet, I'm hoping that I'll have more information or you know some kind of recommendation for you uh, to move forward. But my recommendation now is not to release the lots tonight. Okay. Do we need a vote on that or? No. 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 So. Okay. No, com no other comments by the board? Okay. So um, we can move on to the next uh, item, which is uh, the chapter chapter 40R. Um, we're going to discuss our comments uh, on the latest draft and review of the CRC comments. And, you know, I, I, your minutes, again, I, uh, I have to compliment you, Pam. They're, they're really good and helpful. Uh, on this. Uh, we did get into it, but I think some of the board members have dove in further and we can, you know, discuss that this evening. And again, we don't want to have a long meeting this evening. Um, so I suspect that we're going to push this, uh, you know, one more to one more meeting, if, if, if not more, because it's, there's a lot of things, uh, a lot of satellite issues kind of going around uh, in this, but um, my, my, my thoughts were that we would be able to at least make a recommendation and concept about, you know, a portion of the proposal uh, with, with amendments uh, or the entirety of it, you know, would, would you know, receives our, our approval. Um, but I think the next item, zoning priorities, is something that we need to, to talk about that is more urgent is my understanding from talking to Chris prior to this meeting. Uh, that's what that's what town council is looking for us uh, for. But um, so we will um, talk about 40R and I, uh, I guess, um, again, I know some of you might have done some research. So I'd, I'd, I'd love to hear, um, you know, additional thoughts and my understanding is the developer is, uh, excuse me, the, the consultants are waiting for our final comments before they finalize their their report. Correct, Chris? And do you have anything else to add, Chris? I'd just like to say that, yes, the consultants are willing to take final comments and then they would like to wrap this up. Um, and I think my recommendation would be to, um, if you wish to make some kind of recommendation, maybe not tonight, but maybe next time we discuss this, about whether you um, you like the 40R concept in general. Um, obviously, there are changes that would need to be made 
to this proposal in order to bring it to town council if you were to decide to do that. There's also talk about the potential for doing a similar thing over in East Amherst, which given the fact that the town is acquiring um, land on Belchertown Road for affordable housing, uh, that's going to promote more development in that area. So it may make sense to not do the 40R in the downtown, but to do it in East Amherst instead. The other thing is that we have a long list of um, zoning amendments that the town council is asking the planning department and the planning board to work on. And some of those um, are not uh, necessarily compatible with 40R. I don't know if you want me to go into detail about that, but one of the things, well, I won't go into any detail about that, but my recommendation is to wrap up this project either tonight or two weeks from now or a month from now give the um, consultants your final comments. They can package it up, give us the final product, and then um, turn our focus to the zoning priorities that the town council has asked us to work on. And then at some point in the future, go back to 40R and say, is this a good thing? Do we wanna do this? Where do we wanna do it? Maybe we wanna do it in East Amherst. Then we ask for money to maybe hire these same consultants to look at East Amherst, but I don't feel like we're ready to say wholeheartedly, this is the package that we want, and this is the package that we want to do in downtown Amherst. That's just my my thought about the matter. Okay, let's hear from the board, Janet. I'm not sure, this, this is almost at a point of a point of order. I'm actually kind of confused because I thought we already got their final product and um, I had this, you know, because they've rewritten it a few times and I, I thought we got that already and then it was kind of put into our hands. And then I thought at the last meeting we decided that um, Maria and, and Doug had sort of volunteered to take it and to work on it. And I, I, I was sort of surprised to see it on the agenda here because I thought like, oh, maybe Doug and Maria are making a presentation. But then I thought maybe you would you'd show it to us first. So. I'm kind of lost in the process. And then, um, so I, I don't, so that, so first question, wasn't that a final report already? And then what was it that Doug and Maria agreed to do? And then I also think, um, and this is hard not to go sliding into the next agenda item, is that um, most of the 40R would probably be most active in parts of the BL, which the zoning priorities you know, one of the things is sort of a, a some ch serious changes to the BL, and all of a sudden it just looks like these things don't mesh. And so, but just number one and two would be good for me. Like, didn't we get a final report or their final work? And then what was it that Doug and Maria agreed to do? I'm kind of, I just, I'm a little lost. So, yeah, well, Doug is, is up, has his hand up, so he can speak to that perhaps. Okay, so uh, I uh, my perspective pretty closely matches Janet's, uh, at least in terms of what she said there. Uh, I thought we had pretty much gotten the final product from the consultants, and um, I and Maria had volunteered to take a close look at it and do some work on it last time. So uh, over the holiday, I did take a probably a day and a half and look at the language and start uh, start to look at the the physical parameters as well as just how the how the package is formatted um, I've, I've always been a little bit uh, unhappy with the way it was written it, it seemed a lot looser and squishy than uh, what I think I that a proper bylaw ought to be. It ought to be pretty black and white so that if I put on my architect hat or my developer hat, uh, I don't have a lot of room to, you know, uh, you know, things are pretty black and white and I'm not going to be uh, making, trying to get through loopholes. So um, I am not complete with what I was doing. Um, I, uh, you know, I think I've had conversations with Maria and with uh, Jack that I, you know, and even my, my comments to the board, I was most supportive of the provisions in the BL 
uh, less supportive of the downtown area, but I'm, I'm trying to just to look at the whole thing. Um, and then we can either enact the, or recommend the whole thing or just recommend part. Um, I guess the last thing I'll say is similar to what Chris was saying, uh, the fact that these other recommended zoning changes have come to us from CRC and town council um, has started to feel to me like we have a lot of different balls in the air. Um, you know, earlier on, uh, actually before Christmas, when Maria and I started to dive in, I and she were talking about trying to do some 3D modeling to show what exists now in the zoning versus what 40R might permit. And, um, but now, you know, if you take a particular parcel, you'd have to do what exists now, what 40R would, would allow, and what half a dozen different zoning changes would individually do. And then, you know, whatever combinations of those that you might imagine would end up getting approved. So, I, I welcome uh, Chris's recommendation that we uh, let the consultants finish up. You know, from my point of view, Chris could just tell them, thank you for the, uh, I think it was November 10th product that they gave us and, uh, you know, go on to your next job. Um, so, you know, I think it is in our hands, but, you know, I think that's all I'll say for right now. Uh, actually, I will mention that uh, we have talked to Chris about asking the consultants for their 3D uh, computer model that they use to generate the renderings that they did show to us. Um, they uh, it sounded like they were willing to give us to, to give that to us, but their their CAD guru was on you know, on, on holiday or, or away when we were asking. So they needed to get him back before they could send it to us. Um, we also had a little bit of a talk with, I think it was Ben Brager in the planning department about generating a, a base uh, that would include uh, property lines and roads, but also some grading. Um, it sounded like that could be a time consuming effort so we thought we'd see what the consultants sent before we asked planning staff to spend any time on it. Um, so that's, that's my report. Um, I, I think Maria ought to give, give her report. Thank you, Doug. Uh, Maria? Um, yeah, so I, um, I tried to carve out some time over the holidays, only managed a couple of hours. Um, and what I had hoped to do is more two-dimensional study where um, I compared literally the November 10th proposal to existing zoning, not to like all these new um, zoning priority options and just see where the Delta was between what we can do now versus what the consultants proposed. And I only got to the heights. I haven't gotten to the setbacks yet, the front setbacks. Um, so I thought that was worth just the study because just studying the heights has already been pretty enlightening as far as realizing um, how it adds and takes away. Um, I guess what I prefer is to get right into the next agenda item since that ties into this very deeply and um, not go too much further in the 40R because I agree with all the balls in the air, does it make sense to put our energies there when you know, town up when CRC has this three month priority list that um, a lot of these are very exciting to me. So if I were to put, you know, whatever little time I have, I, I think I'd rather maybe focus on things that our elected officials have, you know, finally given us as priorities. We've been waiting for uh, two or three years now, I think. So, um, so yeah, I did start to do a few studies, but um, I think before the holidays, Doug and I had really <laughs> broad visions for what we could get done and then, <laughs> Uh, the weekend rolled around and I just kind of panicked and quickly did a diagram. But um, yeah, I, I'm excited about if we could get to the next agenda item, that would be fantastic. So it's not really much of a report other than just comment. Yeah, I, I'd have to say that, uh, you know, town council has, has moved quickly on this and it has kind of changed the landscape for us all. So 
Uh, I definitely agree with with everything everybody has said. Janet, do you have another comment? Um, this is on the idea of um, having the consultants do the CAD work um, and hopefully for free. Um, if they're if they are going to give us the the three D modeling, um, I would like them. I, I'd like to see North Pleasant Street um, showing five story buildings on both sides on the the street. You know, they showed it on a four lane street. Like if they could, they showed four stories on one side, and if they could show us five story buildings on both sides of North Pleasant accurately done, I think that would be really helpful to us in terms of what we're visualizing. Um, and then on um, Triangle Street, you know, four-story buildings tapering down to three um, across from Kendrick Place, which is five stories on, you know, the very narrow Triangle Street. So that would be a great visual to have because the pictures they were showing weren't exactly what was in their final, um, the final draft. And not, you know, so I, I thought that if they can do that visual with their CAD person and, and nobody else has to. The other thing I want to say is I didn't really expect to see 40R back you know, after a two week holiday break. So I, I don't I don't want anyone to feel guilty. Like I, I was expecting to see this come up later with Maria and Doug, but I agree that it's it doesn't seem easy to do with the other zoning priorities. So thank you. Uh Chris. So I wanted to say that um we weren't expecting that the consultants would do further work or that they would do any 3D modeling for us. I think what Doug and Maria were looking for was just the base material from which the um, consultants did their work, you know, and then Doug and Maria would um, then take that and do more work with it. So we're, we're not expecting the consultants to do anything else, except I was imagining that planning board members might come back with comments like, well, instead of having a, you know, five foot side setback against these buildings that you should have a 15 foot side setback, things like that, details like that. But it's, it appears that, you know, it's, it's going to be a lot of work to even do those things, even look at it to the point where, you know, on Cottage Street, you would prefer to have a 15 foot setback against the residential buildings, but on, you know, Halleck Street, you would prefer not to. So, um, my feeling is unless until we're really serious about proposing this it's probably not worth it to put that level of effort into the 40r and i think we should just tell the consultants okay we're done so give us your final whatever you're going to give us and then we'll be happy with that along with giving us the things that maria and doug asked for so that if we want to go back to this in the future, we can do that. Does that make sense? Yeah, I also like uh, Rob Crown's suggestions with regard to, you know, if we're gonna do additional work, just focus it on a, a subset, which is mainly the BL between Prospect and North Pleasant, uh, just to simplify things. Cause there's a lot of other, as proposed, there's a lot of, uh, issues and I'm just I think Rob's suggestions were pretty good and I guess if we're going to re you know revisit it I, I would suggest we just look at a, a portion of the proposed 40R for downtown mm -hmm. uh, just my suggestion so uh, Andrew thanks Jack um, I just I know you mentioned this Chris and apologies for for not keeping track of it but I, I was very intrigued by the possibility of East Amherst what we're saying though is consultant this go around just wrap up which is purely focused on downtown and then if we want to pursue the east amherst that's something that we would negotiate as a separate body of work that's right okay and do we have do we have funding to be able to do that i know that's just given the fact that we've uh we've got the the purchase and sale agreement for the property on belchtown road like um is that something that would that could happen in calendar year or at what point might we be able to, to bring on the consultant to help with that if if we decide we want to look more deeply into East Amherst? Uh, may I answer that, Jack? Yeah, but I, I think with Andrew being on the CPA uh, committee, <laughs> it, it might be good for him to kind of, you know, what has happened in that regard? What happened with this Belchertown Road proposal and what what is, what is it exactly? Oh, so yeah, it, it was, um, 
essentially it was brought to us the timing was extremely awkward uh in that they the um we were in essentially the middle of a negotiation to purchase this property on a, a i think it was 132 Beltstown road it's a, a couple of adjacent properties that could be used for um adding affordable housing within the cpac uh, mandate um and so we uh as a as a committee unanimously supported the prospect of moving forward with this. We had allocated uh, up to $800,000 um, for the purchase of that, which we ended up not needing quite as much, which is, which is great. But this is an opportunity for, uh, for us to add, I wanna say the number is 40 affordable housing units is what Rob Crowner thinks that we'd be able to put on the location. Um, it is right near the east, you know, if, if folks are aware, it's it's kind of across the street from Cumberland Farms on your way out to Belchertown. Uh, it's walking distance to the to the uh, to the traffic light there. Um, it is you know it's 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 proposed and, and really sort of complementary to the uh, to the opportunity that we have at the, uh, the the library there, the library site as well. So two potential opportunities to build residential density. Um, around a village center, uh, bringing in affordable housing as well. Uh, it, it's really, it's like checking all of the boxes for things that we would like to do as a town. It's consistent with um, our master plan vision. So I think something we should all be really excited about um, for us to have as an opportunity. And, and if there is the ability to be able to leverage 40R, um, to help with the overall economics of that, to help with the, um, you know, the, the speed of making this happen, getting a, a developer on uh, on board to develop the site, which we don't have right now, uh, I think that's 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 all something that we should really be seriously thinking about. So, so my my question just to, to Chris or or Andrew is is this property to be purchased by the town with the monies, and then with the developer, does the developer purchase the land and do the development or does Amherst retain the land and the developers like leasing it or what's the model for this type of, of thing? Yeah, actually a great question, Chris. I'm not sure if you have an answer to that. I don't think that's been worked out yet. Nate Malloy is in the attendees and he may have um, more information about this. Nate has been following this project with um, with Dave Zomek and the building commissioner, and I believe he uh, has also been following the project through CPA and finance committee, et cetera. Um, so he may have more information, but I think that those things haven't been worked out. The idea is that we, the town would like to put this uh, property and the property at the East Street School, uh, they'd like to package them together in an RFP um, and have developers give proposals for um, developing affordable housing on both of those sites. And I don't know if it would be completely affordable housing or if it would be partially affordable housing, but both of the developments would have to be uh, a 40B project, which is different from 40R. 40B is more like what we saw at 132 Northampton Road, where um, you have to go through the Zoning Board of Appeals and get a comprehensive permit in order to do the work. And so the, the way the 40R would complement this whole thing is that it could um, potentially open up other properties or make other properties in the East Amherst Village Center more attractive. <clears throat> and um, you know, all of a sudden we'll start to get some kind of um, you know, critical mass of things happening in East Amherst. And I think that would be that would be a good thing. And this is something Janet's been talking about this for a long time. Ever since we started talking about 40R, she, she was kind of pointing at East Amherst and saying, I think that's where it should happen, not downtown. So, you know, it's interesting how these things come to pass. Um, but now that we've learned, we've learned so much about what is 40R and how does it work. And now I think, you know, we can pivot a little bit to say, oh, we think it would work better over there than where it's currently being proposed. We ha haven't definitely made that decision, but um, it seems like we're kind of moving in that direction. So does that make sense? Yeah, thanks for clarifying, Chris. Mm -hmm. 
Thank you. Uh, Maria? Um, I, this was a really timely conversation because um, I'm a little torn about, you know, sort of walking away from the 40 yard downtown because the one thing it did do was provide affordable housing, which even if we fixed, fixed VL, it doesn't necessarily, you know, bring that element into downtown, which is something I thought this 40 yard, you know, did a lot of things. And one of the big things was that affordable housing component. So, um, you know, the RFP is really exciting. That'll take a couple of years to process, to develop, and then a couple of years before construction. So, you know, you're five years out again, and I feel like the urgency of what Mr. Hornick was bringing to us shouldn't be lost as far as, you know, we need more affordable housing and especially downtown. So I'm a little torn about, you know, uh, not having the 40 R be sort of one of our priorities as a planning board, but I think um, given all the, like Doug was saying, all the balls up in the air, maybe it's something that we just have to keep on our back burner somehow. Excellent point, Maria. I, I, I agree. I mean, I just, there, <laughs> we need housing in the worst way. Um, Doug. Yeah, I guess uh, one comment I'd make in response to Maria's comment um, it was my, it's been, I had a little bit of back and forth with Chris Brestrup about, uh, different things at one point. And she was saying that, uh, if we, if we did start to get housing, um, I think Chris, correct me if I'm wrong. I thought if we started to get housing on the BL, uh, because we would be adding units to, to, uh, property that currently doesn't have units, that it could conceivably kick in the inclusionary zoning portion of our bylaw. So we could end up with some affordable housing through regular as of, you know, regular zoning rather than 40R. So, you know, we could end up with some affordable housing even without 40R, I guess. Do you want me to answer that, Jack? Yeah, yes, please. Yes, so yes. it depends on what's proposed. If you propose something that requires a special permit, either for the use or for um, a dimensional modification, then a certain dimensional modifications, then you would be um, required to uh, have affordable units, just like uh, Barry Roberts down on University Drive in that um, 70 University Drive. He was required to have uh, four affordable units in there because he needed a special permit for some dimensional modification. So the same thing could happen in the BL district. So I think that's what um, we were talking about. Um, so I, I just wanted to say one more thing, which is something that I've just realized. I think I realized it over the weekend. The list of um, zoning amendments that the town council wants us to work on, if the BL were added to uh, footnote B, which is kind of an, you know, esoteric thing to say, because I don't know if everybody knows what I'm talking about, but it would take away the requirement for lot area for um, dwelling units in the BL. And therefore the BL would become more like the BG district in terms of how many dwelling units you can fit in a, in a box. In the BG, you can build your box however big you can get it based on the dimensional requirements. And however many units you can fit in that box, you can go ahead and do it. So if we, if we connect the BL district with footnote B, the same thing is going to be true in the BL, which means that the, the current differential that we have between how many units can you put on a property in our existing zoning and how many units can you put on it in 40R, it, it sort of goes away um, to a large extent. And so the, the attraction of the money that the state would give us for that differential either disappears or becomes less. So, the, so there are three aspects of 40R that are attractive. One is it provides affordable housing, well, four maybe, one is it, it gives you more density, it provides affordable housing, it's got design guidelines, and I don't know what the fourth, oh, this, the money from the state. So the money from the state would kind of either go away or become much less. 
you'd still have the other three things, affordable housing, design guidelines, and density. But I just wanted to get that out there because um, that is a little bit of a conflict or a, I don't know, something that just came up. Um, reasons why 40R and the changes that we're thinking about making that are at being asked by the town council may not, you know, fit together as well as we want them to. So like my recommendation is work on the zoning priorities that the town council is asking us to do, which is again, something that Janet um, brought up, like why don't we fix the underlying zoning? She brought this up a few weeks ago, fix the underlying zoning and then maybe you don't need 4ER. So anyway, I'm kind of going in that direction. So I'm not sure what the question was that I was trying to answer, but I said what I have to say. <laughs> Whatever you said was, was uh, is, it was interesting. Uh, so Janet has one comment, but I'm just, I'm thinking from 40R, from the developer's perspective, the, you know, they're, and I guess this is for inclusionary zoning uh, uh, developments as well, but the 40R uh, in and of itself, um, doesn't really provide the developer much more incentive, except that they get to have a larger building, more efficient in terms of construction and, and size mm -hmm. and that sort of thing, correct? Yep. Okay, so um, Janet? So I, I, I don't wanna do this now, but can we do like a BL clinic at some point where we just spend, I don't know, like, um, just like a special meeting just to talk about you know what people perceive as the problems in the bl because i think there's like four options on the table for how to fix it but the bl isn't just downtown there's like a little piece on um route nine near um fort river um collision and there's another piece in university drive and i don't think there's a is there a fourth one floating around is that is that just it but i just think it's like it's a weird zoning thing. There's problems with it. And I can see like four options for fixing and like fixing the underlying problems. You know, I think we could change it to BVL, which is more flexible, getting rid of footnote, adding BL to footnote B, and then just changing the dimensions in the BL to make it sort of fit better, you know? And so I wonder if we could just focus on that for a couple of hours in a special meeting or a you know, a special meeting of the zoning subcommittee and the planning board just to like hone in on it because it's, it's hard in this kind of meeting to really understand. You got to kind of look at it and look at pictures and then your head hurts and you have to kind of talk about it a lot. Mm -hmm. So that's my plea. Well, it, it seems like we're kind of deferring this to the CRC town council anyway, because they've already kind of moved ahead. And I'd suggest that we just kind of wait and see you know what the directive is from the from our town government um as far as what as well, far with as regard to the the zoning priorities and the and and the suggested changes that they uh that they just recently came out with i think they've given them to us and they want us to work on them I well that, well work on them. <laughs> that's our next topic <laughs> all right so we we've uh so at this point we're just going to recommend the count uh, the consultants wrap up the report and and uh, I don't. Uh, I guess we're not going to. You know, I, I think the, the zoning priorities is are will be taking precedent uh, for the immediate future. And do you want to make a statement about whether you think forty R is a good thing in concept, and it may be appropriate in. Yeah, I mean, just, just I mean, going looking at our minutes from the previous meeting, it seems like we're we're somewhat on board. Uh, I don't know. Um, I'm 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 good with it in concept, and I don't know how you word that, uh, but you could uh, say you're good with it in concept, but it needs further exploration, and you need to figure out exactly where it should go, something like that. Yeah, I'm, and we're, I think we're supportive of of addressing the housing crisis in in town. I, I think every you know I, I thought that was a common theme. Um,
or you don't have to make a statement about 40R. I can just call the consultants and say, we've talked about it a lot. Let's wrap it up and, you know, we'll get back to it sometime in the future. I, I feel like we've put enough work into it. That it'd just be nice to kind of give a, a feedback to the CRC um, with how we feel on it, but I defer to the other, you know, members on the board on, on what, what we should do. Um, Doug? Yeah, I, I, I guess I'm, I was, I was going to respond to something that Chris said in response or uh, earlier. I think 40R also gives the developer a slightly more streamlined process for getting permitting. So in addition to some of the other things that I think either you or uh, Chris were saying about the advantages, I wanted to add that to the conversation. Okay. Um, I guess in terms of where I stand with 40R at the moment, um, I think I'm, I, I think Chris's phrasing that we thought it needed more exploration seems right. Um, you know, not only for Maria and me to explore kind of what we think of what the proposal was in downtown, but whether, you know, I think the wider conversation about whether downtown is the right place to do it is a good one, especially in light of the East Amherst potential development opportunity. Um, one thing that I did uh, come across over the holidays when I was looking at it was that uh, the, the State Department of Housing and Community Development, DCHD, has to approve those, the, the bylaw, when we initially adopt it. Um, but I realized, but I believe I read that if we ever decided we wanted to abandon the bylaw, they would also have to approve that. And I have a, a, a strong aversion to entangling alliances that I can't extract myself from. So that gave me pause, uh, especially downtown, you know, where we could be tied in perpetuity to something that may outlive its usefulness. So um, that's just a few thoughts, but, but uh, you know, right now I think we're better off saying, you know, if we have to make a statement, I think something kind of that we've, we're looking, we've looked at it closely. We think more exploration is needed, but we're not rejecting it outright is probably where I would, where I would end up. Thank you, uh, Johanna. Thanks, Jack. Um, it's a really interesting conversation. I think to some extent, the interest in 40R stemmed from, a, you know, just a need and a desire to advance the vision of the master plan. And, you know, to some extent, it's a, it's just a means to an end. And I think a lot of us thought, oh, well, this seems like a good mechanism to, you know, get affordable housing, leverage state money, get the density, get some design standards in place, get the transitional zoning. Like there are a lot of things that are in the 40R package that kind of make you nod and say, yeah, that's what our community wants. But now I think with the, you know, um, with this more comprehensive set of zoning priority that are, you know, we're going to have, assuming it moves forward and gets adopted, will affect more than just 18 acres of our downtown, but actually, I don't know, align the overall zoning bylaw for our town with the goals of the major plan. It seems like that's another means to achieve that we're looking for and is potentially I don't know there's part of me that's like wow that's that's a much bigger thing to chew on and if like if it 
doesn't move forward or gets you know held up in the process, then we've mit we've lost time. Um, and I am aware of the time we've already lost in some ways. Um, so I'm caught you know nervous about that delay. But um, but if there's momentum behind a larger zoning thing, and I I also see the value of the you know the East Amherst Village Center project and. So I think I support this, although I too spent several hours digging into the 40R proposal, but I'll consider that just helpful homework. <laughs> did you, right, thanks. May I ask, uh, Johanna, did you have comments that you wanted to send to me to send to the consultant? About I your... sent you some, I think, something like that. I can receive them or if they got buried in your inbox. Yes, they may have. I uh, I wasn't here for part of the time between the two holidays and before the holidays, so um, I may have missed your comments. I'll I'll resend it just to put it at the top of your inbox, Chris. Thanks. Hey, Johanna, you seem your like cut your audio and yeah. video seem a little. Uh, uh oh, are uh, they dodgy? Body dodgy. That's a good word. <laughs> just just so you know, I. It, 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 for me, anyway, it it it, it uh, cut out. But, okay, so, thank you. Sorry. Just so you know, uh, Tom. Sure. I just um, I just wanted to piggyback. I, I was listening to Doug and, and agreeing with with pretty much everything Doug was saying, um, as well as Johanna. I think you know all along I felt like no matter what we did, looking at the 40R, why I encouraged us to look at it and to spend time with it, is I think there's a lot of work that was put into it and a lot of research, and a lot of time, and that there's something we can learn from it. And whether we deploy 40R as it is, or that we take tactics and elements of that and deploy that through, um, you know, our own sort of updating of our bylaws in different ways or attacking some of these elements that um, the CRC has passed down to us. I, I think it's a learning opportunity and whether we need more design guidelines or whether we need to adjust the zoning in a BL in accordance with certain things in order to get, you know, um, higher density or low income housing or whatever it is that we need. I think we learned a lot. We heard from the public. Um, we aired this and we got some feedback. So I think that, you know, the putting it out there was a really great opportunity for us to learn. Um, and so no matter what, whether we apply this to another location um, as a group, um, or uh, whether we take facets of it and, and, and try to find ways to deploy it. Um, I think it was a useful exercise. I mean, I learned a lot and I have some comments. I'll send them over to you, Chris, as well via email. Um, um, but I think it was very, it was very helpful to know that this work was, um, was tested and supported and, and that we can actually learn from it. So um, I'd like to, us to keep an open mind about it as a document and maybe not the roadmap to fix all our problems, but as an opportunity to at least take away something that can help us um, address some of the issues that we have in our own town. Thank you, Tom. You actually, you reminded me why, you know, we kind of picked this up again because of those design guidelines they came up with where we're, we're were, were illuminating for me. And if they were illuminating for you, that's that's even better <laughs> uh, being an architect. But so uh, good points, Andrew. Yes, it's kind of losing my train of thought. Everybody, I, I was just nodding my head with everybody um, in the spirit of moving things along. If yeah, I, I like the idea of us having a bit more of a a formal declaration, I think, as Chris originally worded it. Like, if if you'd like a motion to do that, I would be happy to do that. Uh, or if we just want to move forward, I'm also fine with that as well. I'm good with the formal declaration. If if then I, we have, um, I, yeah, I, I I think it's a good idea. I mean, I think it's I think it's kind of an important thing for us to, to yes. have that that clear voice. So. Um, does Chris want to? We do. You, you've been jotting notes, or, or one of the board members uh, want to take a crack at it. Um, I would. I would nominate either Chris or Doug to do that, since um, they were both very articulate in their comments. Yeah. So Chris? I think what I said was that. Um, 
you support the idea of 40R in concept. Um, however, you realize that there are um, a lot of details that would need to be worked out and that you're not sure that the downtown is the right location for a 40R, that you would like to explore um, another location, perhaps East Amherst Village, and um, that, you, that you feel it, it was a worthwhile um, endeavor to study 40R, something like that. I, I would say the entirety of downtown being appropriate. Okay. Mm -hmm. Is when All right. it addition. Uh, I, I don't make, quite understand uh, that, Jack. She, I mean, uh, you know, we're talking downtown. It, it just the the entire scope of it they had was might have been a little overreaching, I think, because you know there were areas you know pointed out by CRC, you know, by the post office and up on Triangle Street that were just that need, probably needed more work than than other areas. So that's why I just clarify that as proposed in its entirety may not be appropriate is the geographic scope of it yeah would need to be refined yeah do you have maybe pam has written down what we said <laughs> <laughs> oh. Well, I have written down that the planning board supports the idea of chapter 40 R in concept. And I missed a little something. Um, and then I have explore another location, which is possibly the East Amherst. Um, and then over here on the side, I wrote. Um, the geographic scope. So, Chris, help me out here. Let's let's put it together. Well, I think if we are going to consider downtown, there are a lot of details that need to be worked out, and geographic scope is one of them, and dimensional requirements is one, and refining design guidelines is one. So, so can we lump that into some words like? Um, further exploration, deeper exploration. I've got all of this on a recording, so. Well, I have it recorded too, um, but even still when I go to actually write it into the minutes, mm -hmm. we're gonna have all so this. We're gonna, meet, we're gonna meet in two weeks and we, we just wanna make a simple proposal based on the input. Let's just do it then. I mean, it's. Uh, um, sure. And maybe, I don't know what can be done via email, but we can send you comments and mm -hmm. iron something out. But sorry, sorry to put you on the spot there, Chris, for, for this. But, but we do need to move on to the zoning priorities. M Mr. Marshall um, has his hand raised. Yes, okay. Maybe and then, and then there's someone us. in the audience that has uh, their hand up too. Yeah, uh, I, had, I just wanted to remind everybody that Pam Rooney is one of our participants at the moment and I think she wanted to talk about 40R before we move on to the next agenda item. Okay, Pam, and then there's also Janet Keller, I see. So Pam, um, if you have uh, any comments you'd like to offer at this time. Hey. Pam Rooney. Hi, Pam. Hi, I didn't realize I was even on. Thank you. I say, and thank you, Doug, for um, recognizing me. I wasn't expecting to speak on 40R, but I would, I would agree that as it's currently written, it's a very rough document and we need a, a lot of work to make it usable. I think one of the things that also needs to happen is as there is any conversation about the changes or modification or reapplication in some other part of town, that there also needs to be robust public comment and input. So that's that's generally, you know, if you were planning to go ahead with this tonight and say, yes, we we want to recommend to adopt it, 
and, and recommend it to the CRC, I would have to say, gosh, you know, you, you're sort of missing some, some vital public input on this final draft. So um, I think your wording tonight was great. Let's just set it aside. We know it's, a, it's one tool out of many and probably the downtown is not the place for it. So thank you. Great, thank you, Pam. Uh, Janet? Oh no, uh, this is Janet Keller, sorry. Um, hey, Janet. Hi. Um, I don't do the, I don't know if I'm out of order here, um, but when you were talking about BL, it, I just happened to have um, in, in front of me uh, Chris's February 26, 2016 memo, um, and I was intrigued by the fact that I hadn't realized she talks about the different um, BL zones. Um, so anyway, it's a, it's a terrific five page piece of work. Um, and um, so I just wanted to go back to Janet McGowan's suggestion of doing a, 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 a clinic on, on BL um, and that you already have a very excellent um, little overview of it by Christine that she did um, on February 26, 2016, that would be extremely useful for orienting people because it can be pretty complex. So that, that's it, thanks. Thank you. So, um... So I think, so the 40R, we'll keep it very brief. We will make it a, a, an item for the next meeting. Just keep it very brief, just so we can make that, that, that recommendation. Motion. Motion, yeah. Okay. So um, I think we can move on to the zoning priorities. And Chris, would you like to introduce this? Yeah. So um, if I can find my sheet, let's see here. Maybe Pam could bring up that um, motion sheet. Yes. That the town council voted on the other night. I have it in my pocket somewhere, but I can't find it right now. Okay, so the um, CRC has been working on um, trying to figure out what what their zoning priorities are, and they've um, taken input from the planning board and from the planning department and from members of the town council, and um, they came up with a list of um, items that they think are their zoning priorities. So they presented them to the um, town council. First, they presented them on December 21st, and they had a robust discussion about them. And they presented them again, uh, and voting was postponed until this past Monday night. And on Monday, they again had a robust discussion about these priorities. And uh, I think they talked for two hours. Um, Kathy Shane introduced an alternative motion, which um, would have, uh, would have, what should I say? Um, it was very thorough and very, um, it would have been a lot of work. It required, well, it asked for a lot of studies of alternatives, um, for the different things that are being proposed here. Um, anyway. Uh, what they finally decided on was this list that Pam, I think, can bring up now. Can you bring that list up, Pam? You've got it. Um, can, can you see it? I have it up. I can see the link to it, but I can't see the list. Really? Oh, no. Uh, well, everyone received it in an email recently, so 
Do you have a PDF version, Pam? Yeah, uh, and I linked to it um, in my in my PowerPoint. So let me just. Why is it doing that? Could it, nobody could see it? Nope. Were you just sharing your point, not the your whole screen? Has his hand up. Does he want to ask a can question? Can you can you see it now? Yes. Yes. Okay. All right. So they broke these things down um, based on information that the planning department had given them about um, how long various things would take to do, and it's kind of interesting because when I was thinking about this, I was thinking that. How long would each individual thing take to do? And they kind of grabbed onto it and said, oh, you said that all of these things would take three months to do. So let's put them all together and see if you can do them in three months. So that's, <laughs> that's what's going on here. Um, the town council is going to be um, interested in working on zoning in the early part of the year. And then they have a kind of, um, well, they, then they have to focus on the budget. So they're going to be focusing on the budget in the later part of the spring and through the early part of the summer. So they wanted to get um, ideas from us about zoning before March 15th so they could work on the before they have to throw their energy uh, towards the budget. And then um, realizing that people are going away over the summer, they said, well, you can give us the second bunch of things um, by September 1st. So that's what's going on here. So they, they uh, made a motion to ask the town manager to present zoning amendments that reflect these different ideas to the town council by these two dates. And so the town manager reach, reaches down to the planning department and asks the planning department to work on these things. And obviously the planning department works with the planning board. So I'm bringing these things to you. They will also be um, discussed at the CRC and you may decide that you wanna have some joint meetings with the CRC on some of these items. But um, I, can, I can go through them with you and give you a brief description of what these things are. So the first thing is one of the things that we've been talking about, which is this adding the BL district to footnote B. So what that means is taking away the lot area requirement for a dwelling unit in the BL zoning district. This is pretty complicated. Um, it is described in that memo that um, I wrote back in 2016. There are a number of issues with it that need to be resolved. And one of the issues is which BL district are we talking about? So back a number of years ago when Jonathan Tucker was work, was here and was working on zoning amendments, he came up with um, a zoning amendment that would just restrict this to the BL districts that are adjacent to the downtown. And so that includes the BL district north of Triangle Street, the BL district that's west of North Pleasant Street, and the BL district that's along South Prospect Street. So that may be what we decide to do. On the other hand, we may decide to include the other BL districts, which include University Drive, and um, there's one in uh, at, um, by the railroad tracks along Dickinson Street, and I think that's it, but um, it may not be. But anyway, so it's a complicated issue, but it the idea is that currently the BL district is not friendly to uh, residential development, even though it's right adjacent to um, downtown and sometimes it's a buffer zone between downtown and the residential, the general residence district, it really is not friendly to building new housing there. There's a lot of existing housing there, but you couldn't really build what exists today there because the zoning wouldn't allow it. So that's what's up with the BL district. Um, footnote A uh, has to do with allowing um, the planning board or the zoning board of appeals to grant a special permit to modify dimensional modifications, dimensional requirements, excuse me. So if you look at the dimensional table, um, 
I don't have the dimensional table here, but if you go to section six of the zoning bylaw and look at the dimensional table, table three, which is towards the end of the zoning bylaw, you'll see that a lot of things, a lot of dimensional requirements in there have this little footnote A attached to them. And um, if you turn the page and you read about footnote A, it says authorizes the uh, planning, um, the permit granting authority or the special permit granting authority to grant a special permit to modify these dimensional requirements. And in this case, um, we're suggesting adding maximum lot coverage and maximum building coverage to those, um, to that footnote A. The next and, one, it's footnote B. The first one is footnote B and the second bullet is footnote A. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. there you um, I got another question. Um, so I, I uh, in my packet, we have the December 21st, 2020 memo that is, a, re that is a, re uh, a report. And then what's on the screen here, what's on the screen? On the screen is the motion that the town council voted on. And it should be pretty similar to the um, December 21st memo. We may have moved things around a bit. I'm not sure. Okay. I did send this to you in an email, but you may not have gotten it until today. Uh, I, I, I'm behind two days on my email. Sorry. Um, right. But this does pretty much track that December 21 memo in the sense that the content is the same. This is kind of a shorthand version of what's in that December 21 memo. Okay. Okay. Thanks. Um, so the third one is uh, propose a revised supplemental dwelling unit bylaw. So that's what SDU stands for, supplemental dwelling unit. And this was proposed, it was, a, it was um, some, an idea that Michael Burtwist came up with. And we all thought it was a good idea. And the planning board actually proposed it to town meeting in the spring of 2018. But that was after the uh, vote to go to the charter form of government and town meeting was very leery about passing substantial zoning bylaws, um, given the fact that the town council was gonna come into being a few months later. So that it didn't receive um, two thirds vote and some people voted against it or abstained because they thought that the town council should be involved in making this decision and it shouldn't be made by town meeting. But I think many people thought it was a good idea. The idea was to allow um, supplemental dwelling units that would be larger than 800 square feet, that they could go up to 1,000 square feet. Um, and that was as a result of conversations that we've had with people who are trying to build these things. And they say, 800 square feet is really too small. If I'm gonna live there with my husband, um, there's no room to move around. We can't have a second bedroom. The hallways are too narrow, et cetera. So, so that's what that's about. Um, the demolition delay bylaw is section 13 of the zoning bylaw, and it has to do with um, the historical commission review of historical buildings that are over 50 years old that are either fully or partially going to be demolished, proposed for demolishment. And um, there have been a lot of questions and comments and concerns about the existing demolition delay bylaw. Um, the, one of which is, is this really zoning or should this be in the general bylaw? And so the current um, proposal is to take it out of zoning and put it into the general bylaw. And the historical commission has been working with planning department staff on um, exactly how this would be worded. So that, that will be coming to you. Um, and the reason that the planning board is involved is because any change to the zoning bylaw requires planning board um, or planning board recommendation to town council. So even though this is proposed to come out of the zoning bylaw, you have to make a recommendation. Do you think it's a good idea for it to come out of the zoning bylaw? And then town council would vote to put it into the general bylaw. Um, the next thing. Could I, I'm sorry, could I interrupt here, Jack, do you mind? No. Um, could we go back to the second change about footnote A to maximum lot coverage and maximum building coverage? Because mm -hmm. does that, I have two questions. Like, could you explain what that means? Like, is there any limit to the lot coverage 
for the building coverage? And does that apply to every zoning district? We, we, we kind of like segued away from that really quickly. So it's just, could you run back on that? The second, the adding footnote A to max. So footnote A is already attached to maximum building coverage in certain districts, such as the general residence district, the um, village center residents, fraternity residents, the uh, general business district, business village center, and business neighborhood. So it's already there for those districts. Maximum lot coverage is also allowed to be modified in the fraternity, residential fraternity district, the general business district, and the business neighborhood district. So the proposal here is to extend that um, allowance to other districts. And maybe it would be all of them, or maybe it would just be one or two more. We haven't really looked at this carefully enough, but um, there seems to be a desire on the part of some um, CRC members to look into this. They think that it's a problem that um, there isn't that allowance to grant the special permit to modify the lot coverage and building coverage for other zoning districts. So take a look at the dimensional table, table three, and you'll see, you know, tiny little, they're really superscripts, they're not footnotes, but superscript A attached to certain dimensions. And you'll see where we already allow this, and then the conversation will come up well. If we already allow it in those places, where should we allow it? In, should we allow it in more places? We have to talk about that because that's something that at least the CRC was interested in doing. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Okay. Okay. So the next one is work with the council to begin the conversation on housing types expansion um, in preparation for meeting the September 1. 2021 priorities below. So that has to do with some of the things that um, we started to talk about in the zoning subcommittee, like allowing duplexes in more locations and allowing triplexes in more locations and perhaps not restricting some of our residential zoning districts to um, single family dwellings, you know, to, to actually allow duplexes or triplexes by right if they're owner occupied. So the idea here is to begin the conversation about that, not wait until September 1st to begin that conversation. Um, and we've started to have that conversation in the planning board and in the zoning subcommittee, but we haven't really done it fully. Maria had some ideas about that um, when we were in the zoning subcommittee. She had, I forget what it was called, but she had this wonderful image of um, working from, you know, one type of housing to other types of housing in a kind of continuum and how, you know, you wouldn't want to put a 20-story apartment building next to a single family house, but if you had some transition of different sizes of houses as they moved towards the larger houses, maybe that would make sense. So I think this is kind of a, an extension of that conversation. The next one is apartment buildings. Allow them in more zoning districts by site plan review. I think right now they're only allowed by site plan review in the business general zoning district. So consider allowing them in other zoning districts by site plan review. Right now, they're, as I said, they're allowed by special permit in other zoning districts, but only in the business general district by site plan review. And the next one is remove footnote M. And footnote M is um, something that was put in place probably, I'm gonna guess 20 years ago or more, um, when the Spruce Ridge townhouse development on High Street was being proposed and the neighbors were very um, adamantly opposed to it. And they decided, I'm not sure if footnote M actually ended up applying to that um, development or not, but it was kind of an, outgrowth of that development. I think that people now think of Spruce Ridge as being, a, you know, okay. They don't seem to be bothered by it, but back then they were very concerned about it. So footnote M requires that instead of having 25 
um, hundred square feet uh, for additional dwelling units in the RG zoning district. You have to have twelve thousand square feet for the first um, for the first dwelling unit, and then you have to have twenty five hundred square feet for this for more whatever you add to that first. But um, if it's an apartment or a townhouse, footnote M says that you have to have 4,000 square feet instead of 2,500. So the idea is to um, go back to the 2,500 and not require the 4,000 square feet. And that seems to be um, something that would help to promote uh, development in the RG zoning district. The next one is revise apartments demo definition. So the apartments definition says that an apartment building can't contain any more than 24 units. And the other thing it says is that you can't have more than 50% um, of the units be of any one type. And what the result of that is, is that people propose mixed use buildings and mixed use buildings are not defined. So you could say, well, you should add a definition for mixed use buildings into this list. And I agree with that. But um, so people build, propose mixed use buildings. You can have an infinite number of dwelling units in a mixed use building, as long as you have some section of it as something that's not residential. And it could be pretty small. We've had instances where um, the mixed use portion of a mixed use building ends up being something like 200 square feet. So, and the rest of it is, is uh, dwelling units. So it's sort of, um, I don't know, it, it bothers people that you have to kind of um, create um, a, a use that you didn't really want to put there in the first place in order to call your, your building a mixed use building instead of just calling it an apartment building. And that has to do with the limitation on how many units you can have in the building and the fact that you can only have 50% of them be of any one type. In a mixed use building, they can be, they can be all one type. They could be all studios. They could be all four bedrooms. There's no restriction on it. So anyway, this is looking at the apartment's definition and figuring how to, how to fix it so that it works better. Um, I hardly think anybody builds apartments anymore except in outlying districts. I think they're building one down at um, either South Point or the Boulders. And they recently built one in um, on Belchertown Road to replace a building that got burned down. Um, do you wanna move on to the September one items or have you kind of had it? <laughs> we can go to the September one next time. Uh, I guess is, it, is, is the September one uh, included in the December 21st memo? Yes. Uh, you might as well. I'm, okay. I'm good with it. I don't know if there's any other <laughs> opinions um, on the board, but. All right. So the dimensional regulations in the RG and RBC districts have to do with the fact that we have a lot of lots in the RG district. I'm not sure. I haven't really looked at RBC very carefully, but in RG, um, a lot of lots, including lots of you know, people who are on the town council um, are undersized. Um, the requirement is that you have 12,000 square feet of lot area and 100 feet of frontage in the RG zoning district. I think um, Steve Schreiber's lot is smaller in lot area and smaller in frontage. And he's recognized that fact. And, and there are other lots in the RG district that are also non-conforming in that way. There are also lots there that have like, you know, 190 feet of frontage, but they can't be divided into two because they don't have 200 feet of frontage. So the idea here is look at the dimensions that are required in the RG district and think about how they could be modified to allow more development to occur there, more infill to occur. And I think you know, if done properly, if it's got um, design guidelines and it's, you know, a decent looking building that fits in with the character of the neighborhood, people might be amenable to that. So, so that's what that's about. Um, lowering, bar lowering barriers to development of duplexes and triplexes, um, that is connected with this thing that I talked about before 
work with the council to begin a conversation on housing types. So do we want to allow duplexes and triplexes in more areas than are currently allowed? We don't even have a, um, a unit or a use that is called a triplex. We have single family, we have duplexes, and then we have apartments or townhouses. Apartments and townhouses can have three units, but it's not specifically spelled out. So the idea is maybe we would like to allow triplexes in other zoning districts, like perhaps RN. Um, RN is kind of a typical single family um, zoning district. I live in the RN district and it's almost all single family houses, but should we, if we need more housing, should we allow duplexes and triplexes to exist in the RN and perhaps some other residential districts as well. And I think the idea here is that they would be owner occupied. Um, we currently allow owner occupied duplexes in the RG zoning district um, with a site plan review. And should we also allow that to occur in other zoning districts? People would be reluctant to have these be um, investor houses where there's an absentee landlord for obvious reasons. But um, if you have an owner who lives there and is, you know, carefully monitoring what goes on in the other units, maybe it's a good idea. Um, the next one is frontage regulations for residential zones. So that relates to the dimensional regulations in the RG and RVC, which we've already talked about. The next one is look at appropriateness of the use table for our, for VC, village centers. And this is something that Dorothy Pam has brought up a number of times, which is that, well, you allow, um, you allow residences to be more densely packed in the residential village center um, zoning district, but you don't allow any services there. You allow them in the BVC, the business village center, but you don't allow them in RVC. So should we consider allowing some small services to be located in RVC? And probably we should, but we haven't really looked at it very carefully. The next thing is transportation issues, which, you know, the planning board really doesn't have a lot to do with transportation. You talk about it when applications come before you, you talk about, you know, whether there's bus service or whether there's bike um, stands and how much parking there is and that kind of thing. But um, it is something that the, that the town council would like to look at in more depth. And I'm not sure exactly how they're thinking of approaching this, but they're asking for help from the planning department and the planning board for any ideas that people might have to um, resolve some of our transportation issues. And the last thing is that we have $40,000 that was appropriated back in 2013. And the purpose of that uh, appropriation was to work on zoning in the downtown and what we then called the gateway area. And the gateway area is the area between Kendrick Park and um, UMass, essentially. It's the area along North Pleasant Street um, where Mercy House is and there are a number of fraternity houses there. But um, so the money was appropriated for the zoning for that area and for downtown. But we think we can use that money to work on form-based zoning related to downtown. And people keep talking about form-based zoning and design guidelines. So if we can use that $40,000 to get help with that issue, just like Northampton is getting help from um, Dodson Flinker Associates um, on, on their form-based zoning for uh, Florence, um, you know, we think that would be a good use of that money. So that's my rundown on the things that we are being asked to work on. Well, uh, I must say, Chris, it, it, your work, uh, I know Janet, or excuse me, Mandy, uh, the memo is from Mandy and, and CRC, but it, it has your, your imprint all over it and it's quite impressive, this document. So you, you've been doing a lot here, so. Well, it's um, over the years, the planning board and the planning department have been working on these things and it would be nice if some of them would come to pass. Yeah. No, uh, I, I'm, and I have to, personally, I have not 
gone through it thoroughly. Uh, but uh, at this point, should we have a uh, discussion to get others? Uh, I see Andrew's hands up. Thanks, Jack. This, I mean, this memo you underscore, this memo is astounding. Like going through this um, was really eye opening and, and helped me understand exactly what we're trying to accomplish. So I, I echo the kudos there. I was just curious what is the what is the product for march 15th is the idea that you would have new language drafted for each of these so we'd have like formal language ready to uh to approve the idea is that we would present formal language and analysis and idea of impact to the town council and then they take it and they say oh yes we think these might be good ideas now here planning board go back and refine them and here crc go back and refine them or they say go hold a public hearing we're not sure what they're going to say they want the the draft or the um you know the written material and the backup and why we should do this and what the impact would be given to them by march 15th this may be more than we can um manage we hope that we'll be able to manage most of it but um we'll see and i think starting on january 20th is when i i hoped to begin to introduce some of these things to you okay so that, and that was kind of my next question then so you will be as you are working through and making these these recommendations you're going to share them with us get feedback from us mm -hmm. um Okay. Yeah. Love it. I mean, I, I, I think these are really um, excellent topics to be tackling and I think really timely. So sounds great. Thank you, Andrew. Janet. So I, I, I that was my question. I, I have a question similar to Andrew's, which is about next steps and the process and who does what. And so CRC is going to do a deeper impacts analysis. They have this um, policy called community impact review. And um, at the CRC meeting, or at the, the, not the last town council meeting, but the one before that, Mindy Johanneke said that they didn't do that deeper analysis of like impacts on you know, different parts of our community. And so um, that was my understanding that they're gonna do a deeper analysis now that they have more specific items to focus on and then at the town council, there was, um, Lynn Greismer had said, there's gonna be a very robust public process, but there was no real specifications about it. And so, so, I, and so I'm, I was kind of wondering like, what are the next steps and, you know, who does what and, you know, you know, getting CR, CRC's um, more deeper analysis, would they just check in with different parts of the community and look at economic impacts or impacts on historical buildings or, different neighborhoods and economic levels and things like that. Um, so I just, I kind of trying to figure out what the next steps are and, and what we do. Um, I also think it's great to look at this whole list together because, you know, as I, I kind of have pointed out is if we did a few of things on this list, the BL would have a footnote on every dimension. And so then, you know, what does that look like? And so I think that what we could bring to the or the planning department planning board is kind of like looking at how all these things work together or kind of, you know, work off other parts of the bylaw and to figure out like what will buildings look like in the BL, you know, if these changes are made or what would, you know, if, if there's no maximum lot coverage in RN, like how big could the building get or how much lot coverage could there be? And what does that look like on a specific lot? And then what does it look like over time? And um, so I, that kind of analysis, I think, you know, is kind of what we could bring to the table since we're more familiar with the bylaw and um, could do some of those CAD designs and things like that. Um, so that that was one idea. Um, but, you know, so these are a lot of changes and they're going to kind of work off each other. But are we going to be doing that at, you know, every planning board meeting, spending an hour or two on that? Or are we going to add meetings? Because it looks like a pretty heavy lift. But um, to do so. Those are all great questions, and I don't think that I have answers for them tonight. I had How's our schedule look, Chris, <laughs> with regard to upcoming 
you know, I mean, it doesn't, I, I haven't heard you mention too many large items coming our way in the next month or two, but. I am not aware of, of um, applications coming our way, but I know people have been working on things um, out there in the hinterlands. And so I expect that there will be applications, especially as we start to come out of COVID and out of this winter of, you know, mm -hmm. the stress. Um, so I think we're gonna have to be working on these things alongside working on our normal applications and things things that come to us like Amherst Hills and you know it's going to be um, a lot of work I acknowledge that um, we've been asked to do this so you know I'm willing to jump in with both feet but there may be a limit you know and we may not be able to get all these things to town council by the 15th of, of March which is only what a month two two months and one week away <laughs> Well, um, I think when they originally set the date of March 15th, we were back in December. It was December 16th or 21st. And then, you know, it was kind of three months till March, but now it's only two months and a little bit till March. So it's a heavy lift and there's a lot to do. And I acknowledge what Janet said about a lot of the analysis that it needs to be done, whether we do all of that or whether CRC does some of that. Um, that has yet to be seen. I don't think that's been completely worked out. We certainly would do our normal type of analysis like we did the last time the BL district came up. Um, it did come up as a proposal before town meeting and I think it was the spring of 2016, but we hadn't had time to study it well enough. So we pulled it, pulled it back. Um, but we have a lot of material to describe what it's all about. And some of these other things, we have material as well. So not all of them are starting from scratch. Um, many of them, you know, we do have starting documents, but it is, it is a lot of work to do. Yep. Can I, can I also, um, I know that, I think we were talking about this last spring. I can't remember, um, but you know, we have a lot of people really interested in zoning in Amherst, and I think that's true everywhere you go. And um, so is how do we, you know, one role we could do is making sure the public is informed on what is being worked on and getting sort of input from them. And I think Christine Gray Mullins, Maria, you have to actually help me because I think we were talking about this in the zoning subcommittee about putting like on the web page what we're working on is, am, I, am I making this up or I can't remember, Christine Gray Mullins was talking about like making the, our webpage more interactive about what we're working on. And this is a, a lot of stuff at, at once. And I know we had a, you know, the town council got a huge amount of comments of people. And so I, I wonder if that could happen, like we could activate a webpage. I think you've done that for specific projects, um, but a way that people know what, the planning board is working on or the CRC is working on and they have a way to post comments or send input. I mean, I hate to add to the workload, but I remember we were talking about this, I think in zoning subcommittee, maybe at the planning board, I can't remember. Maria, do you remember this or? Um, maybe I should ask Christine Gray Mullins because she was very excited by the idea. I think it's when we were talking about master plan update about a way to involve the public. It was specifically about the master plan. That's it. Okay. So but I wonder if this, yeah. we may be able to do something like that. We may be able to put some kind of a comment um, section on our on our web page. I am not that familiar with how the web page works. Pam is the web guru in the planning department, um, and also Nate. And Nate is on this call, I think. But um, anyway, we can talk about that and, and potentially come up with a way of working it out. We do post our packets so people have access to what it is we're working on. Um, how to draw attention to that um, is another question. Mm -hmm. And so we can, we can talk about that. Planning department staff meetings. We have staff meetings every Tuesday morning. So um, that's something that we can think about and think about how we could um, make that work. All right, let, uh, we got, I think Doug had his hand up for a while now. Uh, Doug? Hey, 
Yeah, um, I guess I, I just kind of wanted to say that I viewed the vote of town council on Monday, not necessarily that they were endorsing all of these items, but in a more neutral sense that they were supporting uh, planning department and CRC taking a close look at them and coming back with an analysis of what each one would would result in. So that in a sense, it's sort of calling the question on all these ideas that have been bouncing around for years in the planning board and some of which that are in the planning department and some of which that came out of various consultant reports and have never really kind of come to a vote. So this was a way for CRC to recommend that we finally just take a good look at them, bang them into shape that seems like the best shape we can make, and then give them to town council to either vote up or vote down. And then we can all move on, having learned some of the politics about each one and where the town council stands on it. So I am, I'm delighted that these are finally getting this kind of examination. Um, I hope that the analysis that Chris and Nate and the rest of the planning staff do, whether it's nominally for planning board or CRC, I think our planning staff is gonna do most of the work. I hope that there is a fair amount of graphic analysis that illustrates the implications um, you know, Chris, the, the memo that you did back in 2016, which it was really, you know, it's very illuminated, illuminating, but you never really get a picture of, you know, here's the size of the building on a parcel that you end up with, as opposed to the sort of dry numbers of setbacks and heights and theoretical units. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm hoping that there is some some graphic sketches that that describe massing and that kind of thing in relation to parcel boundaries. Um, so I'll stop there. It's good. We have some good people here in the department who can do that. Thank you, Doug. Uh, Maria? Uh, yeah, I, I agree with what Doug was just saying when I, you know, read sort of the, what is this called, um, sample response from Lynn, where this vote is literally just, it's not adopting anything. It's literally just for study to begin initiating study. And I have to say, um, I think maybe only Jack, you and I were around back when we still had town meeting or we were writing these, um, what are these things called? Articles, planning board articles where we would have a recommendation, a background and purpose, the mechanics of exactly what we would change in the bylaw, the benefits, the risks, and the process of, you know, how we voted as a planning board. And um, this memo does the majority of that. I think exactly what's left is the analysis. And um, yeah, if, you know, if CRC feels like the uh, zoning subcommittee, uh, if we bring in more members from the planning board to dive in, if we can help divvy up the sort of study and analysis of this in any way. Um, I don't know if that happens with a joint meeting or if um, they go ahead and take first stabs at things they're more passionate about. But, um, you know, I'm, I'm literally looking at the supplemental dwelling unit article that's already written. Um, uh, and I, I actually had graphics for this already prepared. So there's actually a lot of work, like Chris said, that has already been done that we can just pull out from the past years and um, refine a little more to sort of, I guess, what we're doing instead of presenting to town meeting, we're presenting to town council. And then through those meetings, public are able to come and attend and um you know put in their two cents or even on websites i think you know a lot of people email and put comments down so there's a lot of opportunity for um input and so i i yeah I, i'd love to know how literally the next steps of uh, you know the crc wants to handle these first three month priority items whether it makes sense to um 
try to reconfigure the zoning subcommittee with um, either new members um, or people who, anyone who's interested in the planning board. Um, I know it's a subcommittee of the planning board, so we're not supposed to bring members from the public, but um, like Janet said, there are a lot of people out there with a lot of really good historical knowledge and zoning, um, passion about zoning, strangely. So uh, I don't know if there's a way to, you know, just pull on people as different topics come up maybe that are more, um, they're more familiar with or they can help out with more. But um, yeah, I feel like this is exactly what I've been waiting for for three years now is, um, you know, what should we study? And so I really appreciate this. And um, I don't know if maybe uh, at the next planning board meeting, if um, CRC members can come and are ready to just, you know, literally say what next steps are, which items they're going to sort of start on what you said, Chris, January 20th, and work with the planning department on and whether zoning subcommittee or planning board can take on any of the particular items as well. So, uh, Chris, you have your hand up, but I'm, I'm wondering, you know, maybe should we schedule the, the joint meeting with CRC for not the 20th, but the, the meeting after? As a we, we've got a meeting with um, the town council on the 20th. Um, and your gentleman from uh, PVPC, Doug Hall, yes, is going to come and present information about recovering the economy from the COVID-19 um, problems. Yes. So we've so, got that going on on the. So I think the meeting after that, uh, do, you know, have the joint meeting with CRC. Is that is that too soon or? February third, joint meeting yeah. with CRC. Yeah, we could do that. To discuss these um, issues that are be that are yes. here, and yeah. we'll have time next meeting to further discuss this, and then. Um, and I like yeah. um, if I can speak. Yes. Being recognized, I like. No, I recognize you. <laughs> <laughs> I like Maria's idea of bringing the zoning subcommittee back together, and that ties into what Janet was saying about studying the BL district and having some understanding of what's going on with the BL district. So I think this could really work well if um, Janet and Maria were still willing to serve on the zoning subcommittee and I would um, be there to help them. And then um, maybe some other planning board member might wanna join. You don't have to have another planning board member, but um, you could. And we would post meetings and just you know talk about these things and work on these things. So those were like, we, they were previously like on a Tuesday? They had um, been, um, initially they were on the same night as planning board only earlier, but then that got into being like, you know, seven hours of meetings and that yeah. was exhausting. So we switched it to Tuesday um, mm -hmm. and perhaps that would be a good time to do it. Yeah, I think that's a, that's a good idea to, to kind of, we, we are kind of have a mission now. Um, also, we I think we were posting as joint planning board zoning subcommittee meetings because sometimes there were more than three members. Mm -hmm. yep. So because I think I think it would be great to have more people on. So should I be in touch with Janet and Maria about appropriate time for these meetings? And is there anybody else who might like to join us? I mean, I'll. I'm, I'm sure, you know, a lot of us would like to try to be there. And then is it an issue if there's a quorum? Doug has his hand up. He looks like yes, he Doug. Doug. Should we add Doug to the mix? Yeah, I just raised my hand because I think I'd probably want to join that subcommittee. I had a separate comment, which I'll give whenever we're ready. For okay. That sounds great, Doug. Thank you. Um, Andrew? Yeah, I'd also be interested in participating in that. I'll schedule our next meeting for, or our first meeting for next Tuesday. Okay. Okay. Um, and Tom? Yeah, I was just going to say that I'm willing to, to participate in that in whatever capacity is needed as well. So. 
um, I'm happy to jump on and, and, and work through that. So, so what, uh, Chris, what happens if, you know, we have a quorum at, at a zoning <laughs> subcommittee? Well, meeting? that's what um, someone, was it Janet, who was just saying, if we post them as joint planning board and zoning subcommittee meetings, then it's okay if planning board shows up. Okay. Um, Pam would have to help me to schedule these as Zoom meetings, but then um, mm -hmm. she could, uh, she wouldn't necessarily have to stay through the whole thing. Um, I would probably need help in sharing screens and sharing graphics and things like that because I'm not as good at that as Pam is, but um, other people could could help. Maria is probably really good at that and maybe Janet is too. And so anyway. Nice. This is great. Um, Doug? Yeah, I was just going to say it, it's my assumption that if it, whatever came to council by March 15th, that would anything that they endorsed that would be the beginning of entering the flow chart that was done back in the fall yeah uh where you know it it comes down to planning board planning board has a public hearing crc has their public hearing maybe they're joint maybe they're not but at that point at the beginning of the flow chart, that's where there are several opportunities for public, uh, you know, public input on the proposals. That's correct. Um, so I guess I'm not really clear whether between now and March 15th, other than the opportunities that are in our regular planning meetings, planning board meetings, uh, whether we need to be scheduling other opportunities for public input. I think that's going to be um, a challenge, especially if we're having zoning subcommittee meetings too, but the public would be welcome to come to zoning subcommittee meetings as attendees. And then, you know, um, whoever is the chair of that zoning subcommittee, I think Maria is the chair of the zoning subcommittee. Um, then she could choose to recognize people or not, depending on what we're talking about. But that would be a yeah, and, and even you know after we go through the flow chart, some items could be rejected by town council based on the public input, and then get resurrected and changed in some way to make them more palatable mm -hmm. with another with another round. Mm -hmm. Yep. So I yeah I guess I I'm kind of hoping I, I kind of hoped that was your answer, so that we could work in a focused way between now and March 15th mm -hmm. without a lot of public input, not to exclude it, but with the assurance that there will be a number of opportunities for public input after we've got something we endorse to recommend to council. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I, I agree, Doug. I mean, it's just sort of like, you know, it, we're like we're in a consulting mode. We got to do our work and then it, it We'll be getting input, I think, via the the process that is in place. Mm -hmm. But uh, Janet, so I think um, I think that the people would feel like it was kind of already the answer has already been chosen and baked if we waited till later. But I also think we could get around um, the issue if we had this website, and so we're, we could just be. Here are these, you know, the five things we're looking at, or I guess there's 12. And, you know, we can just say, you know, meeting on this, send your comments in. You know, one thing I've learned since I've moved to Amherst is that there's an astonishing amount of people who are like retired planners. And, um, you know, I, I feel like every, you know, so there's, you know, so, you know, and then, you know, to get input from people. And I think um, it's one thing to have people to come to a meeting I don't know how we do a Zoom zoning subcommittee, but um, I think that I wouldn't want to lose the input um, from the public during this next few months because you know people are going to feel like. I, mean, I think Christine, you said yourself, it's like if we get rid of single-family zoning in Echo Hill, like Echo Hill is going to people are going to really react to that. I think it'd be best to get that ad idea early, hear people's reactions and do the fine tuning and come to the town council with a good proposal, you know, 
um, we don't really have single family zoning in any district if you can fit your ADU in. And people don't know that. So that could be, you know, someone saying that and maybe someone types back and said, hey, check out this thing because, you know, and I'd be happy to work on that because I just think there's a lot of good ideas and good input and we don't want to go too far with something that is going to be the buzzsaw, you know, because that doesn't help anybody on and stuff. So I think if we did this sort of more interactive website where people go to and know what's going on, having them look for our packet, like even I have trouble finding out what's in our packet at times and stuff like that. So I think that's too much. And I, you know, we have a, you know, probably, you know, 80 people were, you know, wanted more time to give input and know more about these things. And so let's bring them into the process as, you know, kind of colleagues and stuff like that, you know, so I would, I would think the website might help, you know, create a good way of interaction without taking up a huge amount of time. So. So Janet, I uh, just, on your comment about a lot of people that are planners in town, I, I, I question that. <laughs> Um, I'm not a planner, um, but I think a lot of people become uh, acquainted with it and, 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 and just by learning, uh, know enough to be dangerous sort of thing. <laughs> uh, I would say that there is an enormous amount of retired academics in town. Yes. That is a true statement, I think. But <laughs> I've run into so many retired planners or, or current planners, actually. So people are happy to help. Yes. So do we need a vote for the, the reconstitution of the zoning subcommittee? Or I think that's just. I think we're just we're, waking up. Make it up. We're, waking we're, up, but you could um, take a vote to appoint who, Tom and Andrew and Doug to the zoning subcommittee if you wanted to. That seems reasonable. I mean, you've got, you've already got Maria and yeah. they were voted in, you know, a year ago. Okay. Um, um, but you might want to take a, a vote to nominate Tom and Andrew and Doug to the okay. committee. Um, a motion for that, please. I also see Maria's hand oh, yeah. and Tom's hand. Tom? I move to nominate Maria. Tom Long, Doug Marshall, and who was the third? Sorry. Andrew. Andrew, Andrew McDougall, all to yeah. the zoning subcommittee. Any seconds? I will. <laughs> Check second. Okay. Any discussion? Uh, we can do a roll call. Um, Tom Long has his hand up. Oh, Tom, sorry. Tom? Tom, we can't hear you. You're on mute. Thank you. Sorry. Uh, I had a question and comment more for um, Maria and Janet and maybe Chris. And is the size of the committee an issue for you in terms of being productive? What I don't want is for all of us to jump on this committee and make it harder for you to do your work. Um, I'd like for it to be something that you're able to divvy out more work and therefore spread the burden across more people, but um, I've also been on committees where the bigger they get, the harder it is to to manage and work. So you two being um, already appointed, I'd be interested in your insight or feedback on how how many people you think is reasonable to work with and whether it's problematic to nominate these additional people. That's all. So Maria? You... Uh, yeah. So. Um, I was going to actually comment on a previous question about how public can be involved and what we normally did for the zoning subcommittee is we we figure out the agenda, you know, once we know what the priorities are that we're working on, we post that and a lot of people come out of the woodwork because they see something they're passionate about, like inclusionary zoning, like we had 12 people in the room once and then some other uh, mixed use buildings and two people who have been, you know, on select board in the past showed up. So a lot of people will come if they see an item they are interested in on the agenda. So I'm not sure we necessarily need the extra web page idea right now, but we could see how that works. As far as members, um, the more the merrier. It didn't feel like it was like we were just talking in circles. We would literally, you know, we had agenda items. We would say, all right, um, we're studying supplemental dwelling units. Um, 
and we've discussed it a little bit as far as like impacts and ideas for how we can um, make changes. And then we would just literally volunteer. Someone would say, I'll write a report or I'll um, come up with some data or I'll do a little research on what an adjacent town is doing. So it's great because we can divvy up, you know, and it's not like next meeting you have an answer. We just keep, you know, meeting after meeting, sort of churning through the research for the particular items. And it really helps to have more people because it's, you know, more opposing, there's more dead wolves advocates in a way. So we're really testing the ideas, you know, in real time. So it's a real working group. It's not one where we're just sort of, you know, filling the air with more and more words. We're literally, uh, we came up with quite a few reports and I have to say, uh, the previous zoning subcommittee was notorious for that. They actually wrote a lot of the articles themselves and um, not the previous one, previous to me um, did that, not the one I, I was in for the last three years. So um, we'll rely a lot on the planning staff to help us, you know, make it, um, you know, clear and logical, but we do rely on the members to actually do a lot of the homework and um, help out on research so that's not all of the staff to do. Um, I hope mm -hmm. that is true, Chris, that you didn't feel like you guys were doing most of the work and we nope. just showed up. <laughs> no, no, no. So, not at all. Well, also so, maybe we could do is like assign people like, okay, you handle these two ideas and collect information and present them and people could send you in for, you know what I mean? Like we can keep, you know, and, and then, they, you know, you can have like your two pet zoning bylaw changes and work, you know, carry them through or something. I think right, right. I, yeah, I, like I, I carry, like you had inclusionary zoning, Jen, and I had the missing middle, and I think yeah. David Levenstein had um, mixed use buildings. Mixed so use. everyone just sort of picked something they were really interested in and just went with it. And we would talk about it in detail every week or every other week. So, in, in terms um, of the flow, there, it's fine. You don't have to come to every meeting. It's just, you know, everyone's working and busy. So there is no, like, we're not holding you to, you know, have this done by next meeting. It was really like a working group. Also, but, Zoom, Zoom can take notes for us. It can? Yeah. It can give a transcript. <gasps> Isn't it, that amazing? It's a sloppy it's transcript. Not reliable, but it works. So, so you it's know. Sloppy. So Maria, do, do you feel like there needs to be like limits in terms of, you know, in terms of the, you know, public input there, like a three minute thing? Uh, yeah. Would that there facilitate? Were, yeah. Well, well, as the chair, I would call on people to speak. So it wasn't like, I mean, there were times where I couldn't control it, you know, like Maureen Adams was there and she's very, you know, she's got long winded points, but she made her points. And so I did have to do a lot of wrangling, but, um, it's much more informal than the planning board meetings, I have to say. I feel like planning boards yeah. are like one at a time and always speak in, in turn. With Zoom, it maybe we unmute the members, but the attendees are muted and then I can call on them one at a time. But that really, we're not, I'm not calling on the other members to speak. We're just sort of just all talking, you know. Okay. So, uh, it's, a, it's a funner environment, I have to say. I mean, not that this isn't fun, but... <laughs> <laughs> Doug, you had your hand up. You're good, though. Or well, I I I was just going to say to Maria, she mentioned the format of the reports that were done that listed the proposal, the implications, the pros, the cons, or whatever. And I've never seen one of those. So at least those of us who are interested in joining that subcommittee or I guess now that we've been officially voted onto it, now those of us that are on the committee, uh, if you could just send us, or maybe through Chris, uh, so we don't run afoul of open meeting law. We still got to um, vote. We still got yeah, to vote formality. Okay. Well, anyway, yeah. if you could send us one of those, a couple of those reports just to, so we see kind of what the product was, that sounded like an interesting and useful model for a template. Yep, sure. So I do see a hand up in the in the public there, uh, yeah. the attendees, and that's what Pam I'm Rooney. Stop sharing. Hold on. Hi. Good night, Pam. Pam Hi, Pam. Hi. Uh, I'm very very glad to hear you all talking about the details uh, that that you're working on because finally getting into the details. Uh, you began to see why there are a number of folks that were uh, quite concerned in the community when some of these changes are discussed. So I'm really delighted that you're starting to look at them holistically. Um, 
I'm, I'm also happy to hear that there is not an expectation that you all are going to be developing or the staff is going to be developing um, zoning amendments for the town council to vote on, on March, around March 4th, 15th. I'm hearing from some of you say, well, that's the beginning of the public process. Then the town council will decide if they want us to explore them further. That was definitely not my, my understanding. I, I was hearing them say, we really want to see things back on our desk for voting. So I would be, I would be, I would appreciate some clarification of the true um, process and public involvement. So even, you know, thinking about how much of the work will end up on Christine Brestrup's and the planning staff desk, I guess I look to the planning board, I would, I would charge the planning board to be the arbiters of zoning. Uh, I feel like you will be the ones that need to weigh the priorities and the changes, not just the mechanics of each thing, but really how they support the master plan goals. So clearly the CRC felt that the, the priorities that they laid out support very much housing and housing diversity goals. But I want to remind us all that there are other master plan goals that were not quoted by the CRC. And those are that, that we, are, we should create design standards that ensure new development is in accordance with existing neighborhood character and also guiding new housing growth so as to minimize impact on Amherst small town character. So I think that really plays to the planning board strength of um, being able to see that big picture. And again, not just to look at the mechanics of each, of each article. Um, I think the, the other topic that came up tonight, which is 40R, I would say, you know, I, I would, I would encourage you, I'd urge you to think of these things um, comprehensively. The footnote A, the footnote B in combination is a very different beast than just footnote A or B. So uh, I look forward to the zoning subcommittee conversations and perhaps I can help before I can. Anyway, thank you. And um, I'm really glad you're delving into the details. Thank you. I don't see any other comments uh, from the public. So let's just do this vote quickly uh, with regard to the three new members, uh, Tom, Andrew, and Doug. Uh, Maria? Uh, yes. Uh, Tom? Aye. Andrew? Aye. Doug? Aye. Janet? Aye. Johanna? Aye. And myself, aye. Um, I think we can move on, Chris. Uh, yeah. Do you concur? Yep, I do. Okay. So uh, now uh, the next one is this zoning, particular zoning bylaw there, uh, review criteria, criteria and design guidelines, section 11.2417 regarding minimizing intrusion of lighting, review and discussion. And uh, I, I suppose, Janet, you would want to. You know, can I'm happy to move that to a next meeting. And That'd be wonderful. I know, I know, because I'm actually kind of tired after my okay. emotional, emotional trauma of this afternoon. Yeah, I think they're taking the, the electoral uh, college vote is going on right now. Yeah, but, and um, maybe, maybe I could do is write up my notes in a more comprehensive way and send it out. And then we could talk about it. Yeah, but I don't have any paper on it. I know there are some emails, but. Yeah, I can, I can, so, put, I can put that together, and then we'll just do it like at next meeting or something. So, and that'd I, be great. I like to get a little earlier, so we don't get kicked off again. But I, I do think we have other stuff, and so. Yeah, that'd be great. Thank you. Yeah. So, Chris, you take note of that. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Um, topics not reasonably anticipated forty eight hours prior to the meeting for old business. I have no topics. Nope. Um, I, I'm wondering, we, we did bring up a few things. I, I, I hate to prolong the meeting, but just hit these really quick. Uh, the, the thing with Bruce Carson with regard to the yeah. owner occupied thing, whatever happened, did that, did we resolve that or what, what happened there? No, we haven't resolved it. That's another, um, zoning amendment that you could consider working on. We have, 
we have like three tracks of zoning amendments that we're working on. We have the track that is the CRC, what the CRC voted on and presented to you. We have the track that the building commissioner is working on, which is a more comprehensive recodification and fixing of problems. And then we have all of these things that the planning department knows we have to work on, among which are what you just mentioned, Jack. But okay. included in that is flood maps and XYZ things. Um, so three tracks. What we've been focusing on tonight is the CRC track. The Bruce Carson thing I would put into the planning department list of things that need to be worked on. Um, and we're probably not going to get to that soon, but we will get to it eventually. Did Sounds you like a nice matrix you could make up in that regard. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Lord. And you could put it on the website. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Marshall's really good at that. <laughs> it's a higher um, ability to manage our website. <laughs> and then, um, and the, I don't know if this is old business. Oh, Spring Street, where it is kind of, I don't know if you ever talked to Rob more about what's going on with that development. So I know, here's what I know. I know that Archipelago and the contractors seem to have parted ways. Oh. That's sorry. one thing I've been, I have, I don't know if I've pulled that out of the air or what, but I heard that somewhere. Um, second thing is Denise Barbarette wrote, um, a memo to the town council with regard to something that they were talking about. And she mentioned that she thinks Archipelago has been bought out by a different entity, which may be a large, a much larger entity. So I think Archipelago is in transition right now. I think they're interested in doing work in Amherst, but they may be part of a larger organization going forward. And so I'm sure that that organization is going to help them figure out what they're going to do with Spring Street. I don't have any inside information except mm. those things that I just said. Okay. Uh, speaking of Archipelago, that they, they I I saw something where the sorority building next to uh, mm. what's the build uh, what's the development right next door? There? Yeah, Olympia. Olympia. Uh, yeah. yeah. Olympia Place. They bought the uh, sorority building there, and I think they have some idea of doing something similar to Olympia Place, but I haven't seen any plans. I haven't spoken with them about that. I just kind of know about that by osmosis because information floats around here, and I pick it up. And, and the other thing is just that w w the master uh, plan implementation committee is just kind of, we need to put that on the on hold while we do these zoning priority things, I would think. Correct. Well, the Master Plan Implementation Committee has never been formed. Oh. Doug and I worked well, on Doug, yeah. I pulling out the Master Plan Matrix, and I still have work to do on that. Okay. But I think that Doug and I, and, and you all, decided that that was probably not a high priority at this point. Okay. Keep filling just, out that matrix, that that could wait. In fact, Doug, I think, said maybe we report, you know, every few months or every six months. I don't remember exactly what he said, but his suggestion made sense to me that that wasn't something that we needed to spend a lot of time on now, although we've, we've done a lot of work on it. I need to go back and fill in some things that I haven't filled in, but the planning board probably won't revisit it for a while. Okay. I, there's just, you know, those are just a few things that come underneath the old business category that were mm -hmm. bouncing around in my head. Um, okay, uh, in new business, we have the comprehensive housing policy uh, that CRC uh, provided. Um, looks like it's pretty much borrows from John Hornick's earlier uh, affordable housing uh, document. It's 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 a good one. It's a you know something that we have to discuss, and I just don't know that we have the bandwidth right now. If we have you know two months to go through these, uh, you know the zoning issues that we've discussed, but we we wanted to 
so we're just kind of introducing it. I understand, Chris. Maybe you, you take this. I. Uh, so here's what I think. Um, the the CRC is working on this, and they have worked on pieces of it. And I've given you their latest version, which I think is dated sometime in December. Is that right? Um, and they're going to continue to work on it. So people who are interested in this can tune into CRC meetings. And I will keep asking Mandy Joe to send me their latest version. But you can, I don't think I sent the latest version to you until the last few days. Like maybe I sent it on Monday. So you probably haven't had time to really read it. So we can put it back on the agenda for the 20th or the 3rd of February or something like that. Perhaps CRC will have done more work on it by then. But by then you may have time to um, absorb what they've done to date. Yeah. And I think we decided we're just going to provide individual comments to CRC versus, I mean, we'll discuss it, but we were not going to vote provide a, a uniform planning board, you know, recommendation. It was just going to be more efficient just for each of the planning board members to provide comments as they saw fit. To provide those to CRC or to give them to me and then I will we'll give them to you, but we're but individually, not not collectively as a you yeah, know sure. uniform That's recommendations sort that of thing. Would be, yeah. So everybody, you know, you're free to to look at that housing uh, policy and and provide Chris with your comments and she will direct it to the CRC. I think Janet had a comment about that. Oh, I'm sorry, Janet. So um, the CRC wanted like the planning board's input on the policy, but I, I was really unclear about when they wanted it from the meeting from like a few weeks ago. But I do think it'd be great for people to make comments. And um, I went and looked at the master plan section on housing and then also um, the housing market study, which is filled with like intense data. But the beginning of it is some really good summaries. So I could send that out to people because it really talks. It talks about something I think the policy mix mixes, which is that the university is like the driver of housing demand and that the, the market study and, um, you know, it's like, the housing policy doesn't talk about the demand created by a university and also doesn't really talk about the impact of a few things that are sort of missing that are in the master plan and, and things like that. So I, I, I actually kind of could send people like these sections just to read because I think it's a good background. But um, I think I think they were looking for comments from the planning board, but I wasn't and all these different boards, but I wasn't exactly sure when they wanted it. Yeah, but, I'm not either. It, I'm it, not it, either. But I, yeah. So. But I. I, I do think, it's always better. <laughs> yeah. I think it's still a work in progress for them, and they don't have a, a complete picture yet. And my impression was, once they have it complete, then they'll ask for comments. But maybe they can use comments along the way too. Yeah, I, I can't remember how they came. They were talking about all of that, and I can't remember how it landed. So. Yeah. So, anyway. so I, I, as I was part of a, they had. The ZBA, myself, and uh, the, the the CPAC. So they, they had representatives from the, the various committees boards that might have an interest in this, and they. And so, it's it's on our plate, but Chris, just let us know. You know, if you know of a timeline. Mm -hmm. so, I haven't heard of a timeline. Okay, so is there any other discussion that you think we need? Uh, on this other than no just please okay. read it and send me your comments okay so new business uh, topics not reasonably anticipated 48 hours prior to the meeting for new business nothing I don't have any no. okay I I would say new one thing uh, that uh, Doug Marshall uh, presented was looking at our zoning and looking at existing our, our existing development and matching where there's non-compliance with the existing zoning versus what's built and it and uh, and he had a an, came across some uh, examples 
well, Doug, why don't you explain it? But it, you know, it graphically, it really illustrates how dysfunctional our zonings, you know, bylaws yeah. can be with regard to what we have. Yeah, so. I, I, I found somewhere on the web and it, I had found, it might have been with the, one of the metropolitan planning district uh, websites of one of the organizations outside of Boston had done a little brochure that was entitled uh, something like impossible neighborhoods. Illegal neighborhoods. Illegal, illegal. neighborhoods. <laughs> so if you Google illegal neighborhoods, Massachusetts, you may, you probably can find this right away or I can send you another link to it. Um, but they did, but basically they were, they took a number of very desirable, pleasant, walkable neighborhoods that existed in towns around Boston and demonstrated that basically none of that development met the current zoning in those neighborhoods. So it's kind of like people earlier mentioned Steve Schreiber's house uh, and the fact that it couldn't be built today on the lot that he has because his lot is too small. And I think the lot coverage and setbacks are probably illegal too. Um, it was it was a way, so I had, I had sent that link to Chris and said, um, you know, it might be useful for somebody on the planning staff if they had nothing else to do. Uh, An intern. To do a similar <laughs> analysis of some of our neighborhoods, uh, such as the street that, that Steve Schreiber lives on, if you wanted to start somewhere, to, to, to sort of demonstrate that if we wanted to perpetuate that kind of street, we would need to change the zoning to allow it. Um, so that's that's what that was about. You know what, I, I Doug, I think I think someone this would be a great project for a UMass student as an intern with a, as as a GIS study. Because uh, I I know you're bit you're you're loaded, Chris, but uh, mm -hmm. let's 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 think about that. Maybe we can get. <laughs> Have an intern do it because that's what it is. I mean, it's a, it's, it's a just a GIS effort. So, it's actually something we've been thinking of doing for a long time. Um, yeah. In fact, we're thinking have been thinking for years of dividing the RG district into, um, into pieces because the RG district on Lincoln Ave is completely different from the RG district that is represented by Cosby Street and Beston Ave, and it's just the RG district is kind of a crazy amalgam of giant houses on giant properties and tiny little houses on tiny lots that don't meet the zoning. So um, sometime we should grapple with that and figure out RG1, RG2, RG3 and make sense of it all. Make um, zoning that matches what's already there. So illegal neighborhoods is, is the topic. I think I have that. I can send, I think I can send that to you. Mm -hmm. and um Jack, mr yes. long is trying to show you something oh yes okay what is it this uh, <laughs> crc report is a chart that describes how all of the members of the council um all of their houses are too large for their lots <laughs> Um, Where, so, and it talks what, about what page how is that on? the zoning does not describe the character of the neighborhood. So it's essentially uh -huh. doing what you're talking about. Um, yeah. One, one particular group of people. It's on page 19. Of this. I got it. Okay. Ah, uh, anyway, that's it's hilarious. Just, it's, interest, it's interesting, interesting to read and probably something that I think Doug, as you're pointing out, what, what are the characteristics of the neighborhoods we want <laughs> and maybe our zoning doesn't quite reflect that. I think this is one good example and there's maybe more. So it's, I think that is a, a really positive exercise to be explored. Interesting. Thank you. Um, so on to- uh, Jack, um, yes. Ms. McGowan has her hand up as oh, well. Sorry, Janet. Yep. Okay, I just wanted to jump in and I was, you know, if you've ever been to Marblehead, you know how unbelievably beautiful that town is and it probably would not fit its current zoning. And so I think that to me speaks really strongly to the need for really 
strong design guidelines. Like I think if it looks really attractive, you know, you might be less less concerned about how close something is to the street or next to the house next door or how much of the lot it takes up and things like that. And so I think, you know, I really think that the design standards need to be really part of increasing densification because if it looks good, people aren't going to be obsessed with upset with it. And also the master plan says that like 15 or 20 times, like strong design guidelines with increased density. And I think we can get greater housing density if it looks good. And then we have to contend with the issue of undergraduates in neighborhoods and kind of work on that too. So I do really think that some of the most beautiful places like Beacon Hill in Boston that you just kind of weep at and you love would never get built now. And you know, but if you could recreate that good look, like in, what is it, see something Florida, seaside Florida, you know, very dense, very close to the street and beautiful and people really want to live there. So I think that that to me is really, I mean, I, I would look to everybody and, you know, all the architects and people on the planning board to like, if we make it look good and make sure it looks good, people, and it's not like a box somewhere, I think people would be much happier about neighbors being a little, houses being a little closer and cottages in the backyard and stuff like that. So that's my pitch. Uh, I will stop. Okay. Thank you. Um, on to the next section is uh, Form A, A and R subdivision applications. I'm happy to report we have no A and Rs tonight. All righty. Upcoming ZBA applications. I'm happy to report there is nothing new. Oh, and upcoming SPP, SPR, SUB applications. So far, we don't have any upcoming. Nope. All right, on to the Planning Board Committee and liaison reports. Pioneer Valley uh, Planning Commission, I have nothing. Um, the CPA, Andrew. I'm happy to report that we didn't meet and I have nothing either. <laughs> um, very good. And Doug on the Ag Commission? Uh, only to report that I am now officially a member of the Ag Commission, you know, having done all the paperwork with Town Hall. And you changed your background now to like a, a museum thing versus your <laughs> Ag? Oh, well, you know, when, uh, when spring <laughs> comes, maybe I'll get back outside. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> Jack, can we go back to your PVPC report and would you like to say one or two sentences about Mr. Hall and what he's oh, okay? So yeah, so the, the yeah, the presentation um that will be provided, it's gonna be a joint meeting with well it depends how many town councilors are they are if they have a quorum, it'll be a joint meeting, but they town council is invited to join us and this fellow Doug Hall, who I think lives in Amherst. Uh, uh, is a real good data uh, analysis and, and planner. And so he did, you know, uh, uh, studies on the impact of COVID and, and all the trends and, you know, the closure of businesses and, and kind of uh, projected what ramifications there are currently and then, you know, in the near future and what might be down the road. And it was, it was pretty, um, it was pretty eye-opening, um, and I just think it, it just gets you thinking about, you know, what's a downtown without, you know, without businesses, <laughs> you know, that that have been shuttered because of this this the, the economic trauma. Uh, and I just I'm just hoping that you know we we can all collectively kind of get some insight uh, from his presentation. It's solid. It's it's not too long. And it can promote a little discussion afterward, and uh, you know that's that's pretty much it. Thanks. And um, the design review board, Tom. No, no updates this week. Okay. And then we have uh, zoning subcommittee, which we already talked about. Uh, report of the chair. I don't really have anything. Um, report of staff. Happy New Year. Happy That's New Year <laughs> and adjourn at 920.